Uh, first, I want to thank everybody for being here and welcome to the Wednesday night's normal debates. Thank you guys for being here. Again, Demon Mama, thanks for coming in so last minute. We really appreciate it. Thanks for uh, taking the time out of your day to be here. Um, also, as an aside, speaking of Demon Mama, congratulations for her win in the Hippy Dippy Rumble. That was great. I watched it all. That was that was a great performance. Uh, the you. reigning champion at the moment is Vosh, where he will be defending his title this Friday on the Hippy Dippy podcast. Uh, the setup is a fatal four way between Rob Norm, Demon Mama, John Burke, and Vosh, where the last man standing will be crowned the next Hippy Dippy champion. So good luck to all the contestants, and I hope everyone is there to support the panelists as well. All right. So uh, now, the way this will work, two topics. One hour each, I will let each panelist introduce themselves, their political lenience, where to find them, all that good stuff. Um, after which I will present the topic. Then each panelist gets to give their thoughts on said topic in a short two minute intro. Mm. In your intro, please do not refer or give any rebuttal to any panelists, only and only your thoughts on the topic at hand. Then the panel will go back and forth for the hour. And after the hour has ended, I will then ask each panelist to give their closing thoughts. Two minutes for outros as well. Uh, I will be moderating and will be interjecting when there's either a miscommunication or maybe, um, you know, the discussion is getting a little bit too hectic and I need to step in to, you know, uh, get things in order. Uh, so then afterward, we'll take a couple of questions from the audience as well. I'll be in uh, Demon Mama's chat, Rob's chat, uh, getting some questions from from the audience. Um, as far as language goes, please, no insults. You know, as, Del as Dylan says, I won't moderate niceness. But as John Burke says, please debate the topic, not the person. Uh, and that's about everything that needs to be covered. Does anybody have any questions? Nope. No, good to go. No, all right. Okay, so let's get into it. Sounds good. So, uh, the first topic socialism versus capitalism. How much socialism should we implement, if any at all? Should capitalism even exist? And what would the alternative look like? Even though it's argued that a free market economy has been the best we've found thus far, it is also argued that it's not. And there's much better, fairer, and prosperous paths going forward. Panelists, what do you think? Uh, go ahead, Rob, two minutes. Sure. So the, the first thing to say is that one of the hardest parts when talking about economic philosophies is correctly diagnosis what economic philosophy is prevalent in what area. Because oftentimes people want to compare country to country or time period to time period. But we have to be honest about what is capitalism and what is socialism. So I would argue that there are almost no countries in recorded history, including now, that are purely capitalist or purely socialist. For example, in the United States, we lean more heavily towards a free market or a capitalist system. However, we do have socialist policy such as Medicare, Medicaid, other social safety net policies that are socialism. Uh, when people point to socialist countries like those in Scandinavia, the truth is those countries have free markets. They just have more social programs. So what we have to discuss then, and I hope that one of the questions I'll ask all the panelists is, is anyone advocating that we need purely one system or purely the other? I would guess most people will say no, but we'll see what happens. I think they have Having said that, even though I understand the need for some social safety net programs, I do lean far heavier towards capitalism. And I think that's that I would argue the countries we've seen that have successfully implemented more socialism than the United States did so because of the successes of capitalism, because it allowed incredible economic growth to occur in those countries and around the world. And that allowed them to have more social programs. If you embrace, if every country embraced those sorts of programs, I'm afraid that we would see a lack of incentive and an economic decline. Capitalism has been been responsible since 2010 to 2012, lifting 50% of the people in the world out of poverty. Most of this has occurred in places like Africa. Free markets have driven those economies to do so great. And what it means is that's 50% less people that are in crippling starvation. So capitalism is a flawed system, but it is the best system that we've ever had. And although there is a need for social safety net programs, that's why I default to free markets and people's free will being superior to the socialist idea. All right, well said, Demon Mama. Two minutes, go ahead. Yeah, um, in my opinion, uh, we should aim to have as much socialism as we can possibly get. Uh, contrary to the um, sometimes 
popular belief on the right that socialism is when the government does things. That is not really what socialism means. Uh, social socialism refers to workers owning the means of production and a uh, moving away from the commodity form. For those who don't know what that is, the commodity form is when you buy or sell things for money or profit, specifically profit. Um, and uh, workers owning the means of production means that workers aren't exploited anymore. If you do something, if you are a part of a team that does things, everyone will gain from that thing. Um, I think we should aim to have as much of that as possible. Um, we are increasingly living in a world uh, of service economies, um, of automation and whatnot, and um, the sort of turn of the century um, capitalist ideals of, of mass industry and wealth hoarding simply is not serving our needs anymore. I don't think that this is a particularly radical position. Um, the uh, the uh, onset of this uh, horrific pandemic that we've seen is a perfect example of how um, the, the, this sort of like weird private public partnerships all over the world just really are super inefficient and don't allow us to actually respond to things specifically with things that shouldn't be commodified in the per first place like healthcare. Um, we've now revealed that there is a an incredible amount of conflicting incentives um, that are present in cap in hyper capitalistic structures that um, actually damage everyone. They hurt all of the nation because they lead to the spread of disease. They hurt doctors who really just want to help their patients and they hate patients. The only people winning are middlemen who are essentially investing here and there and taking their money and going and buying islands. And uh, yeah, so I think we should push for the most socialism that we can get um, in the most reasonable manner possible. Yeah. Well said. Uh, Mr. Connor points. Go ahead, sir. Two minutes. Yeah, hey, so since you're listening to a disembodied voice, I'll introduce myself a little. Uh, oh, I forgot the intro. Carter. I run a YouTube channel named Counterpoints. I can tell myself to the right, um, and I won't be disembodied forever. As a matter of fact, I think the sun is knocked out, so I'll probably be jumping up in a second. Uh, but specifically in reference to the topic, so uh, just like with Demon Mama, I'm sure socialism is on left. Um, I define, most leftists define socialism as um, the, the decommodification of basic needs and also uh, worker, uh, workers owning production. The reason why th there's um, some examples that I'm okay with. So, for instance, if you're interested in a, a capitalist version of this working out well, there's a company called Publix, privately owned. All of the workers own private stock. Um, and I'm much more friendly to that kind of idea than, I don't know, bloody purge, eliminate the uh, bourgeois class from society. Um, and, and one of the one of the weird things Good about faith. this is, is basically my objections to socialism are not whether or not there's like some moral, uh, you know, moral impetus to people living happy and healthy lives. I think that's one of the indictments of, like capitalism uh, that a lot of socialists have. My 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 uh, criticism or hesitancy around socialism has to deal with the concentration of power. Um, so even in this conversation, Demon Mama cited about uh, how capital country, free market country seem to be slow on the uptick uh, for dealing with a deadly disease. The reason why they're slow to deal with a deadly disease is because of freedom, personal freedom, capital freedom, economic yeah. freedom, all that kind of stuff. Wrong. So it's a lot easier okay. to tell people to shut the fuck up, take the vaccine, uh, quarantine yourself, stay in your home when you have an authoritarian state. I'm I understand most socialists uh, on the uh, basically online, especially in the West, identify as libertarian or anarchist. Uh, but, you know, at the same time, if you, I, I don't understand how you create a state or create a country this is powerful enough to abolish the bourgeois I'm excited without to respond this. also creating a uh, nightmare dystopian state. So I'm sure we'll get that into that uh, in the yes, general panel. And I'll yield and join you beautiful people on video in a second. Sounds good. And just to let you know, uh, there, uh, your mic is cutting out. I know you're probably like on some headphones or something. I just thought I'd let you know. Uh, well, well said. Uh, socialism done left. Go ahead, sir. Two minutes. Sure. So um, I think that I want to make the same distinction that Dima Mama made, that uh, socialism not when the government does stuff or when social welfare. Um, I think that instead of referring to like worker ownership, the means of production, I like the term economic democracy. Um, the idea is that generally we want to have workplace democracy, uh, so democracy within the you know individual firms. We want to have macroeconomic democracy, meaning that profit shouldn't be the key or main um, driver of what society chooses to produce and where it chooses to invest in. And we shouldn't have the capitalists as a class. Um, so those are the three main distinctions. However, as a market socialist, I am very happy to keep um, market 
mechanics within a socialist system. Um, so in short, I'm happy to have like firms that are owned by workers and firms like which SDL. have a lot of state control over investment and firms even which have a lot of regulation in the markets. Um, but I also want to allow these firms to freely compete, firms to freely rise and die, because there's a lot of evidence that this does lead to an efficient economic production. Um, so uh, I guess to present a slight uh, uh, opposition to Demon Mama, um, conventionally socialists talk about ending the commodity form and the way that they do so is through central planning or political planning of some kind. If Demon Mama is an anarchist, she might talk about um, decentralized planning or paricon, stuff like that. Um, this is all political planning. Instead, market socialists tend to think that decommodification comes through uh, basically uh, trying to perfectly align, you can never be perfect, but trying to perfectly align profit with use value. Uh, you treat any deviation between social utility and profit as an externality, and you try to internalize it either via state regulation, state ownership, um, or state changes of investment, like heavy investment into R&D, as we're seeing in green technology. Uh, so in short, the argument is that for economic democracy, we want workplace democracy, macroeconomic democracy, and the gains of growth to be shared much, much more widely by not having a class which hoards most of that wealth. All Reasonable. right, we will Reasonable. now move into the round table. Oops, the round table debate. Uh, I think Connor is trying to get on video. So Rob, just keep a lookout on when he knocks. Um, but gotcha. other than that, uh, go ahead, guys. Um, yeah, uh, the, the one thing that I did want to respond to, um, sorry, I just wanted to make sure you could hear me. Um, the one thing I did want to respond to that, uh, Connor brought up, I don't know if Connor's still listening in, but, uh, if not, um, I'll repeat it. But, um, it, the idea that there is that the efficiency or the, the better handling of a pandemic comes from some sort of authoritarianism. That's not true. It has nothing to do with being able to force people to, um, to take, uh, vaccines at all like that's never even like that is a fa like it's a fantasy talking point here we live in a, in a in a capitalist state here in in Washington where I live and there's plenty of people taking the vaccine now with no demand for being for taking the vaccine it has nothing to do with forcing people to do anything the difference is that um right now as it works the uh healthcare industry is like uh, it's like staring into a garbage disposal of like uh, charities and like like church run hospitals and private company run hospitals and private suppliers and uh, random middlemen who jumped in in the middle of a pandemic to make a quick buck, uh, some of whom were literally supported by the Trump admin, a bunch of stuff like that. It's a nightmare mess. It's like a vomitous nightmare mess. And this you don't see this being the problem in countries that have socialized decommodified healthcare because as it turns out you don't really need i mean you do to some degree uh, obviously canada has some examples of this there are some private things still in the uk but you don't have nearly as much um uh like uh what should i say inefficiencies in going from middleman to middleman to middleman something that i bring up a lot is uh examples of health insurance uh, something i personally have experienced that's a very common thing I used to work in uh the healthcare industry very common thing is to have bidding wars back and forth between a hospital and an insurance company um this sort of stuff means that the entire um uh healthcare industry is just mired in inefficiency and most of that is because of profit seeking behavior so that's something that i wanted to bring up it doesn't really have anything to do with forcing people to do anything although i do agree that a the government having more oversight over healthcare and more power to in, in, to intercede in emergencies is probably a good thing in most cases okay so again one of the problems we're going to have like i understand uh the definition, I agree with the definitions that people said of what socialism is. We haven't defined capitalism yet, but that's fine. Uh, however, when we see socialist-like policies, then I guess I'll say when we see the government, which is the collective will of the people, uh, when they are redistributing people's money, we could oftentimes see uh, that there's a, that that is a disaster and doesn't end up well. Um, one of the things I want to say here specifically, because I don't want this to be a conversation where we're just disagreeing on definitions, is you specifically cited the UK as a place that you would say that's a place when it comes at least to their health care that is closer to socialism that well, you're advocating for I, correct? I, I would say they have socialized health care i would not say it's like they're a socialist country or anything like that sure and sure so right been absolutely they've been increasingly privatizing their health care system over the last uh decade or so and that has led to some pretty major bumps in the road uh, looks like uh but so i don't know but you would agree you would agree that they are far closer to socialized medicine than the United States. Um, 
Yeah, I would say they're closer. Yeah, I mean, okay. I don't know. I don't so, really know okay. if it's necessary to say far. Like, I don't know. I don't know what these okay. these relative terms are are trying to get out. Okay. Of. Nonetheless, the, the point is the UK is doing worse than the United States by almost every metric. In addition to the fact that any successes they have are resulting from vaccines that were made in capitalist countries, which we have not seen socialist countries that I don't even know a socialist country using your definition, but we haven't seen those countries that were able to create any vaccine. So all these vaccines that we're seeing success from that we were all talking about before the show came on were the result of capitalism and for-profit corporations that were able to turn out a vaccine quicker than almost any medical scientist that was in the United States. This is a really poor Everyone said, just real quick, I'll, I'll just, I'll finish real quick. So we heard, we heard them saying over and over, it would be impossible to turn out a vaccine that quick. And not only did capitalism create that vaccine but in the countries we see with more socialized medicines like the uk they're doing far worse than the united states okay so there's a couple of issues with this um with this example um first of all uh i don't know if you are uh, up to date but until very recently through most of the pandemic uh the predominant party in power was the conservative party in in the uk and they have pushed strongly for uh, a lack of public response for um, not having mandates, for not having other things that scientists have unilaterally agreed upon being good for the virus. And I, I was hoping we weren't going to get into like uh, virus denialism stuff or whatever. I hope we don't. Um, but in, in at the end of the day, like uh, I, I think that it's very easy to look at the UK and recognize that there are very different reasons for their uh, lack of success on dealing with the virus. Um, and most of those are the same ones we have over here. The thing about the United States is that thanks to, uh, I guess you could say, if we're going to use the definition of socialism that is when the government does things, I guess thanks to the socialists of America, we have a very, very robust um, public research sector. Um, uh, the reason we get to uh, enjoy things like early vaccines is because um, we have an incredible amount of government investment in research that many times private companies are able to lean on borrow from recruit from uh all like just literally use facilities that are completely um uh publicly funded um in order to do this so uh i just don't really think that's a particularly strong argument it's not like capitalism produced this this is the result of multi like literally multinational companies that benefited from governments in many different places that's not really exactly a particularly strong argument I don't want to repeat what Demon Mama says. I just want to hype a book on this subject. It's called The Entrepreneurial State by Mariana Matsukuto. Okay. Counterpoints? Yeah, so um, I, I did hear a majority of what you guys said, but I was clicking on a whole bunch of buttons, so sorry if this comes out a little bit frazzled. Um, but ba basically, the, the gist uh, of what I was pointing to was not necessarily specifically in reference to COVID-19, more that they're just like everything in, in, in every kind of situation. There are advantages and disadvantages to different systems. I'm a mixed economy capitalist. This is oftentimes why I get accused of not really being on the left, because I think healthcare is one of the things that should not be profit driven. True. Uh, the reason why is because there is something in economics, which is called, uh, I think it's called like inelastic demand. There, there are certain products that you will pay any amount of price for. Yep. Your life is one of them. So if you are, you know, basically facing down the gun of a cancer diagnosis, there is no dollar amount that you will not pay in order to try try to survive. So essentially what's happening in a capitalist society, in a private healthcare society, is that an entire generation of people, the boomers, are spending intergenerational wealth that normally people would just die and pass on to their family. They're spending it on late-term healthcare. And late-term healthcare is so expensive that it's effectively bankrupting these people. They're going into uh, they're going into reverse mortgages Actually in order true. to pay for retirement. They're going into reverse mortgages in order to pay for their health care. They're taking on credit card debt in order to survive into their 80s and 90s. This is a market failure. So the reason why I'm a mixed economy capitalist is because I don't trust, no offense, uh, you cut out Connor uh, to the, the proles out Connor, there. Cut out I don't trust the pearl yeah, market. Connor, can you repeat that? that? Uh, uh, you you uh, you cut off a lot there. Repeat your last. Oh, sentence. sorry. Yeah, la the last sentence was basically like, like I don't trust the proletariat to run a state. I, I just don't. So this is where I'm not a leftist. But at the same time, there are market failures that I think capitalism needs to acknowledge and not run away from. So this is kind of what I was talking about, that we clearly, and see if you agree with me, counterpoints, we have a mixed capitalist society now. That's the status quo in the United States, correct? And and I've been- 
a bar of where do we set the bar exactly. of what's what's free market and what's run by the state. Exactly. And and I think that's basically what every developed country in the world is doing. There isn't a purely socialist country. So I guess I'll just not to just pigeonhole the conversation to COVID. So again, I'll, I'll just say real quick to respond to Demon Mama. Uh, it's not true that there wasn't massive state intervention in the UK. In fact, despite the fact that Tories are in charge, you would be hard pressed to think so. In fact, they've had one of the most stringent lockdowns, uh, which seems to have been non effectual. And I do not believe that there is unanimous consent among scientists that things like lockdowns and things like that work. But I guess that's a conversation for another day. So the question I have just for uh, the, the left wing people in the panel is, is there a country that you would call a socialist country? And if not, what country is closest to the system that you would be advocating for? Wait, do I think there's like an existing socialist state right now? Yes. Um, not really. I mean, I don't really think that there's like an ideal socialist state quite yet. Um, obviously, when we're talking about socialism, we're talking about sort of the ideals of socialism. But there certainly are states that have done that are much further along on that line and have had like major benefits as a result of this. Obviously, the uh, Nordic states are, are a pretty good example across the board. But even Canada, you can look at some of the outcomes in Canada, especially for COVID. Canada's Canada's handled COVID with even a basic, even a basic capitalist UBI um, that it has some social social mindedness and a a more uh, unified approach to COVID has done significantly better than us. Now, with regard to the UK, I I disagree with you on some of the facts there. Um, in fact, it's been incredible incredibly controversial. I actually do keep up uh, with UK politics quite a lot. They were very slow to declaring lockdowns. And yes, while their lockdowns were severe, they were not timed as long as they wanted to. They reopened multiple times against the advice, by the way, of, of their uh, own health ministries. Um, and this and also they have really high population density across most of the country. It makes sense when if you live in high density areas, if you don't quarantine for long enough, if you don't actually uh, maintain these these procedures, that it's just going to get worse. And here's the thing. The worst thing about all of this, I just want to hammer this home on the COVID thing. Um, the worst thing on the on the on the COVID thing is that doctors said that doctors said a million times it would be better to do one horrifically difficult quarantine lockdown than it would be to do three bad lockdowns and now we're on what i mean here in the states we've had just cycles of it i think we're on like even in my state which has done comparatively well we're on like our fourth re redress back into a previous lockdown phase it's never ending because people won't actually do it the right the first time there's actually it's it's really amazing because this also happens just as like a little side note this also happens with per in, in america predominantly um with regard to medicine doctors will tell their patients make sure that you take all of your antibiotics because if you don't if you don't get rid of all of them the only bacteria that will remain in your in your body are ones that are that have survived the first few pills that you took you need to take all of it to make sure they all die or else you're going to get um you're going to get MRSA in your system and and of course people just don't think about that can so we, real quick, sir, guys, to answer uh, Rob's question. Let's, sorry, hold ahead. on real quick. Let's let's be careful to not make this all about COVID. I understand that mm -hmm. COVID has, you know, it's kind of a little tied to socialism, but let's be very careful not to just make it all about COVID. OK, just go ahead. I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, I was just going to say that I don't think that government uh, responses to COVID really have much of anything to do with socialism. Like the conservatives in Japan have done a much better job than have like the more left-leaning medical fair. systems in, in lots of parts of Europe. Um, regardless of all of that, I think that the the take that I would give for like, are there socialist countries is a mixed one. It depends on what part of socialism you're talking about. China has extensive socialization of investment, but it has terrible worker ownership of the means of production, terrible like worker power there. Conversely, lots of European countries have had a very weak recent history of social control of investment and a strong history of worker ownership of the means of production. So I think that the answer is probably a mixed bag. Um, so I guess the answer in short for you, Rob, is no, I don't think there's one country. But when we look at the policies that these countries implement, those policies that are more socialist are more successful. So the argument will be we look at a country, we pick out the policies that are socialist, we say that works good. Let's do that. OK, and so that, the reason I wanted to get to this, so both of you have basically agreed there is no socialist country in the way you would define it, which makes sense if the definition is that the workers own the mean of production. Mm -hmm. I think that counterpoints makes the correct point here is the reason is because we can't get to that. 
ideal. It is impossible to get to that ideal because the only way to get there is through despotism and through tyranny. That's the only way to get there. Every time that it's tried to get to a purely socialist state, we see a disaster occur, such as places like Red China, such as places like the Soviet Union, Cuba, et cetera. And so we could talk about the importance of a mixed economy. But again, I think most of the example, and like this is why the conversation of COVID came up in the first place. I didn't bring it up. It's just something I heard uh, Mm. where the UK has a more socialist system. They have not been more effective than the United States whatever the uh, factors may be. They have not been, period, despite that their health system. I don't disagree with counterpoints, though, that I think that healthcare is broken in the United States and we need to have a significant fix. I don't know if socialism is the way to go with it, but I'm open to hear it because certainly it's a disaster in the United States. Right now we have the Democrats at least providing a solution, even if it's not a good one, Medicare for all. What's the Republican solution? I don't hear anything from them. So I'm willing to hear out anyone who's trying to talk about a potential solution. Absolutely. Um, But so now we're talking. So I think already we're at a point where I think Demon Mama's original assertion that we want as much socialism as possible, as close to 100 percent as possible. The fact that it's never occurred or it can't occur proves that this is a system that we shouldn't be trying to embrace. That's because it's going to result in tyranny. Strongly disagree. So then. Has there ever been a country? You say there's real quick. You say there's not a country now. Has there ever been a country that's adapted socialism in the way that you're suggesting? Oh, I think that many countries have put in have put socialist practices to work to great success. Oh, absolutely. Well, we're not. We're talking based on your definition, which is the workers own the means of production. You could make the same argument if you traveled back in time right now to the the era of the I don't know medieval times. You could make the exact same argument about uh, about kings. Oh, we've never seen a system that wasn't feudalism. What are we going to do without the divine? right of kings is the this is just an this is just an appeal to stuff that happened before and that's not necessarily a good argument i believe in a future that's better than the one that we currently have and the way that we get there is by recognizing that massive wealth hoarding that's only a half step away from what we had during literal kings and queens during the era of monarchy um is not the answer and that we need to move to a much more socialized system that actually gives credit where credit is due part of the problem with the capitalist system is that it 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 it, the defining uh, the defining characteristic of every capitalist society is that the vast majority of people who pro- who have made that society possible, the people who actually live in that society, build that society, take care of that society every single day, see none of the benefits of that society because it's okay. All so real quick, piled up. I just have a quick. I, I just have a quick question real quick mm-hmm. then. Uh, so you're saying that there isn't a country that's embraced socialism, which is the total workers own of the means of production. And you're saying there historically hasn't been one. Can you, is there ever been a country that's attempted to have the uh, a total workers owns means of production? Um, yeah, there have been. A few, I give you actually. the answer. If you, yeah. There have uh, been can you name some of them? Yeah, there's a few. Um, I know that uh, Ro- Rojava was working towards that uh, before America pulled out all support, support of them. I do know that uh, there has been some attempt, a, a considerable amount of attempt to move towards that in, uh, if I believe it's in the autonomous regions of the Zapatistas. There's also been, uh, in Spain, there have been a number of areas that have um, have made major moves towards um, cooperative ownership. And in fact, there is a region in Italy, I'm slipping on the name right now, that has been uh, pr- the predominant, uh, or sorry, the plurality of businesses are co-ops, which is one of the most... Uh, um, economically robust areas of Italy and this place is almost is the vast majority of businesses operating in that area are co-ops so we've had quite a lot of success the problem that we have with this is that there is a constant appeal because let's 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 think about it this way this is the same problem that we have with royalty is that royalty aren't going to say, here's, I'm going to give up my money freely. And likewise, okay. Okay. banks and people who are currently hoarding wealth aren't going to do that. And in fact, we see that. We see resistance on the hands of banks, on the hands of large wealth hoarders like Jeff Bezos, who okay. try to prevent any sort of progress because they're the ones okay. who would have to pay because they're currently So hoarding. I want to try and I answer Rob's question I, a little I, bit I just want to say... I, I, I just, Go ahead. just want to say real quick, I noticed uh, all the examples she gave was very small, isolated areas. We could talk about those specifically. I noticed that she didn't include areas like the Soviet Union and China and other areas that have had millions upon millions of deaths in an attempt to get the workers own needs of production. But I do want to yeah, hear. And, and that's why I want to answer directly, production. actually. So that's what I wanted to say. I think that most of the large scale socialist experiments that have existed for long periods of time and maintain territorial control, <laughs> like the Soviet Union, China, Eastern Bloc, and so on, were mostly created through revolution. I think revolution has a tendency to create extremely authoritarian authoritarian structures, particularly the models that were attempted in the 1910s, 1920s, 30s, and 40s. 
And as a result, those structures were extremely anti-democratic. And so they failed in large part due to that. Um, I like that. That's a whole sub history that we can go on there. But um, I think that it's worth noting um, that like, I, I would, I guess basically the argument that I'm giving is that that model creates more authoritarian systems. Um, that's the argument very simply. Yeah. I mean, I, Honor? Oh, God. yeah, sorry. Um, no, we'll go to you, demon mama. We're doing we're doing uh, some technical troubleshooting while we're fucking doing everything. So sorry, I haven't been uh, more aggressive. No problem. But at the same time, so so basically, th this is my problem though because it's really frustrating dealing with this because, like, on one hand, we want to move to a more socialist model, and when uh, you know social democratic countries have like socialized medicine or something like that, we can claim that as like leftism good. But mm -hmm. also socialism is like this very specific, like niche definition of workers, uh, you know, the decommodification of basic human need and worker uh, workers own to the uh, own the means of production. And I'm more sympathetic to like leftists or socialists who are like, hey, like I'm not a violent revolutionary. I want to win the culture war. So we have like cultural consensus so we can all move towards this thing in the future or something like that. I'm OK with that. But the second that it turns into like, you know, guillotine and, you know, uh, you know, kulak memes and like all that kind of stuff, you lose me completely because basically what happens is whenever you have something that's like pro-revolutionary there's a con there's a concentration of power um basically yeah. the the vanguard party becomes the new oligarchy uh once they get in there it turns out they're not interested in seeding seizing uh excuse me seeding power uh to the proletariat they create a new upper class and we don't escape uh, the hierarchy that socialism is supposed to abolish. And while I understand that some people think that this is like material, for me, this is human. I think human beings, like they, they're they interested in hierarchy, even unjust hierarchies. And the best way to structure a society is to have competing hierarchies that are free to compete yep. within a society, not like completely try to abolish hierarchy in its entirety. You I don't. don't entirely disagree with you um, on certain factors of that. I do. I don't. I wouldn't say that it's human nature. Um, I just think that a lot of times, uh, w when you're faced with survival, you take the shortest path, and sometimes the shortest path is is force. And what that means is that systemic and and uh, and structural analysis is incredibly important. And and also why I don't advocate for authoritarian uh style uh, pseudo communism like i don't i've i've literally on my channel i mean i've literally done this a million times i had an a, a huge debate about my huge problems with the uh marxist leninist approach which i don't really think does a very good job of addressing the exact problem you brought up um that said i think that it there is a a histor a, a historicality that runs um very rampant in america largely thanks to um mccarthy towards a, a, a very long-standing tradition of of just lumping all forms of communism and, and socialism together um, that does a disservice to the actual history of a lot of these ideologies. In fact, um, it's, it almost leads to an, a, a complete ignorance of, of countries that have successfully integrated um, socialist ideals, even if they haven't had them to any, like, to a complete level, um, which I don't think is, I think that's a very weird way of purity testing. Okay. Um, Rob, but, if, I, if I may real quick. Okay. Uh, yeah. So uh, two quick things to say here. The, the first is, so I'm glad that no one's advocating revolution, like violence is bad, uh, political violence is bad. So even if we disagree on economic systems, that's good to have a panel uh, that's at least in agreement on that. Um, but I think what you'll see is, so what we're seeing historically is, one, every time that it's been tried to meet the actual definition of socialism, it's resulted in a revolution and a bloodbath. And second, the fact that it hasn't occurred in any country historically or now shows that even the Nordic countries that Demon Mama and uh, Socialism Done Left will be talking about, they have chosen not, as leftist as they are, they have chosen not to embrace total socialism. And I think there's a reason for it. And I think that reason is largely what Connor Points is talking about here, which is Actually, they is see the utility of having a... Okay, well, you'll get a chance to respond. They see the utility in a mixed economy and they understand that free markets have been beneficial. As I talked about in my opening statement, thanks to free markets and things like that, we've seen incredible increases in the amount of food that's provided around the world, which came from a for-profit commodification mentality, which has lifted since 2000, 50% of the people in crippling poverty around the world out of poverty. Um, we could talk high-minded about ideals, but we're talking about a system that actually fed half the country or half the world. Uh, that's a good system. The other thing I want to say real quick is this idea that it's not human nature. I disagree because hierarchies aren't just justified they're inevitable 
like higher and Connor is exactly right that the way to have the best society possible is to have enough hierarchies that everyone has a chance to be good at one of the hierarchies. Like I agree with that. And if you go back and you read George Orwell, who was a socialist, he wrote a book called the road to Wigan pier. And the first half of this book, he's writing about, he was commissioned by the way, by socialist in the, the, uh, Britain to do so. The first half of the book's talking about the deplorable conditions of these workers and these coal mines at a place called Wigan pier. And it's just hell on earth. I won't get into it now. However, the second half of the book, he says that he's incredibly skeptical of the socialists that are paying him to do this because they actually do believe in hierarchies and their interest doesn't lie with benefiting the people beneath them that are poor. They're actually exploiting the poor and using their plight to achieve a higher position and a position higher in the hierarchy. And so it's inevitable. Human nature will inevitably result in hierarchies, and it's a utopian fantasy that leads to a bloodbath every time we try to initiate it when we say, no, we should reject a for-profit mentality. We should reject hierarchies. Okay. It's not possible, and it leads to real damage. Can I just ask one quick clar clarifying question? and then Yeah, I'll, that, that I'll... was directed at Demon Mama, so we'll go Demon Mama, and then Rob, and then Socialism, Demon Left, and then Connor points. All right, good. I, I have a couple of things I could say to that. So there was a, a lot there. I, I kind of don't know exactly what the coal mining thing had to do. Um, maybe we can get back into that at some point. Uh, first thing, um, hmm. while, like, I, I think there's a little bit of, like, uh, I don't know. Like, I, I sense a little bit of uh, inconsistency on this. So would you say that um that uh people like thomas jefferson and um and george washington and the founding fathers would you say those people were like horrible bloody murderers no okay so you acknowledge that there can be correct reasons to have a revolution right correct okay so uh it 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 seems odd to me that there's sort of this like blanket um, dismissal of all revolutions is bad and also saying well, that's oh, not what i said well that is what that's you, not what it's, i said it's sort of what you no, no 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 what i said was just like socialism i implied exactly what socialism done left said which is those countries that we've seen the eastern bloc the soviet union and china were socialist revolutions and every one of them resulted in horrible bloodbaths are you and aware, he said that's you aware, why I, wait are you aware that slightly before that most countries in europe have had one revolution or another mostly against kings right and we're not talking i'm not fine, impugning right? It just right. sounds, I'm like, not it sounds to me like what Listen, you're doing is you're being very yeah. selective and you're saying, hey, I don't like Russia. I don't like China. Their revolutions went bad. So I'm going to use them to blanket like sort of disparage an ideology that I don't agree with. When in reality, um, we've had tons of revolutions all over the world and some of them turn out great. Some of them turn out bad. The problem with the revolution is, I mean, largely there's a lot of questions that go into these things. Were, was it structured well? What were their what were their guiding principles? What ended up actually traversing? I, again, I don't if think, I could, uh, if yeah. I could just real quick answer this, it, I'm not not impugning revolutions i'm impugning socialist revolutions just like socialism done left it uh, okay I don't think that's so, uh, socialism done, done, done left, left go ahead well so i to clarify a little bit i was mostly trying to say that i agree that the marxist leninist model tends to lead to authoritarian revolutions it's possible that you know were there a different model that it would have gone differently but we can't really reveal that anymore my position is that revolutions really aren't feasible in the modern world anyway so it's somewhat beside the point um so uh, Something I actually wanted to bring up, actually, a partial response to this, Rob, is that um, I, I'm kind of point. I would point to um, two writers on this. One is Darren Asia Moglu, um, spelled Asa Moglu, and one is um, what's his face? Is that an author? Uh, Ber I'm, I'm sorry. Is that yeah, no, I, I can link these later. Um, sure, uh, no, he's a very famous economist, development economist, and the other is um, uh, Bernstein. Uh, and so one of the things that Bernstein argued is that the gradual evolution of like the role of the state in the economy um, allows there to be a democratization of the state that like, hey, you have an additional department of the state that does an additional job, you can make sure that, that thing is democratically controlled by the people, rather than having it all at once where you can't be sure that, that check is actually in the place. Um, I think that similarly, Adrian Moglu presents this history of there's been this long simultaneous expansion of this power of the state and the power of the people over the state that has been extremely successful. And it's created this modern mixed market economy that we've seen today. So the suggestion that I raise is that we go further. In fact, the very success case, the best success case that Adramoglu points to, and I want to say chapter 14 of um, The Narrow Corridor, is Sweden, where the state grew largest, and so too did democracy. Um, so the argument, in short, is let's do more. Connor Point, go ahead. Yeah, so um, happy to disappoint uh, Sock Dunleft's chat with my fucking chud tanks in the next few minutes. Um, so, okay, so his, uh, Demon Mama, I would be interested in some historical examples of socialist success where we're, we're using not the, the lefty, def or the, 
the not even leftist definition, because no offense, I'm on fucking Twitter. Uh, you know, sock Dems get the wall too. Okay. Fucking they're, they're, they're cap cut, cut a liberal and, you know, uh, fucking fascist bleeds and all that bullshit. I see. So I would been be very traumatized by a handful of, uh, edgy 15 year old handful. Teams. Come on. I, demon. You I, know there's I, a lot. I think, wait, I think second, we all okay, are. Wait, listen, of we all, all the people. That on... was like point of one of like seven. Uh, Jesus I, Christ. I, mean, I just got sniped at. Hold on a sec. All right, go ahead and then get your seven points out and I'll respond to this. Okay. All okay. right. And and by the way, like if you're not admitting that you're traumatized by a bunch of edgy fifteen year olds, I you're clearly on not Twitter enough. So all right. So true. So is, true. I'm not. This is. Imps go, baby. <laughs> all right. So so this is this is my problem with the libertarian socialist or the anarcho communist. Okay. I'm a libertarian, but we should do more gun control. I'm a libertarian, but we should nationalize energy. I'm a libertarian, but we should nationalize healthcare. I'm a libertarian, but we should nationalize logistical monopolies like Amazon. And this is my thing. Basically what we're talking about, uh, when, when we talk about government, we're talking about a concentration of uh, like militant power, like uh, the, the, the ability to kill. Civilians inside the United States, we're gonna get this uh, a little bit later on, have a very limited right to reserve their ability to commit violence, um, either in self-defense, uh, basically in self-defense. Um, but the state has the monopoly. When we're talking about these nationalizations, when we're talking about gun control, effectively what we're talking about is we're talking about concentrating one, economic power, and two, uh, like militaristic power, in, in specifically in reference to gun control, in the hands of the state. So when you say, I don't want a revolution, but I want the government to nationalize energy, health, uh, logistical monopolies, I want them to be able to do this, um, like basically, at least from a conservative perspective, a libertarian perspective, whenever you do something that somebody else doesn't want to do that you're not getting their buy in, the implicit uh, the implicit thing that is causing them to do that is the force of the state. And the force of the state is not legislative. It's just not paperwork. It's people who are armed with guns or batons willing to enforce that paperwork upon you. So um, th that's almost my last point. This is my final point, and then I'll shut up. Um, so basically, um, the, I do want to push back on Rob. This is my centrist role a little bit. Um, so, but, but this is actually going to punch both ways simultaneously. Not all revolutions are bad, but revolutions are judged by their achievements, not by their ideals. And oftentimes what I hear from I lefties yes, is very highfalutin ideals. But when you look how it plays out in the real world, I don't see as good of achievements. And with that, I'll yield. Okay, so let's also be careful with the gun control stuff because that's our next topic. Go ahead, Demon. Yeah, oh, don't worry. I'll have to talk about gun control. I, 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 one thing I, I hate is being uh, constantly mischaracterized on my position on gun control. Um, but okay, so first of all, to discuss the sort of libertarian auth divide and Twitter tankies, etc. Um, I, uh, I, I know that they're very obnoxious. I've spoken about this many times. I mean, everyone knows. Um, I literally did the, uh, the, the first major uh, foray into trying to point out who the fuck this uh, the actual numbers of the of the tanky Twitter. Um, there's not all that many of them. Yes, they are very loud. Yes, they are very, very annoying. Um, and yes, they do say things like sock Dems get the wall, which I think is incredibly stupid. Um, however, uh, I do not think these people are representative either offline or or online of the greater movement. Um, just because they're loud and they're close to you and you see a lot of them um, doesn't mean they're actually that many. Uh, as it turns out, 3000 or so accounts on Twitter can make a lot of noise that can make it seem like they're the only ones. But if you actually take a look at um, the communities that exist online, you have communities, uh, the biggest, the biggest left wing communities i can think of off the top of my head are um uh hassan uh vosh you could even argue destiny there are a lot of left-leaning people in destiny's community and these are not communities that are rife with tankies um in fact most of them are ones that are pretty explicitly opposed to people who would say those sorts of things so i mean on a sheer numbers level you're just not correct about that that claim and i i really hate that it's like i recognize they're annoying because i agree i've literally made many a rant i just have a video going up like tomorrow that's about this i think it's tomorrow um that's about fucking uh cringe ass uh, lefty tanky LARPing um, and it's just it's just very silly to equate that and again it's the same it's the same problem that I see with the a a a historicity which ties into this when you talked about revolutions and them being judged by their outcomes um, 
we rarely ever actually see the same level of charitability applied to overseas uh, revolutions, even ones that I don't agree with, that we have here. I mean, after all, keep in mind that after the American Revolution, there was a series of incredibly bloody conflicts that broke out on this, on this, uh, uh, you know, we had, what, the Whiskey Rebellion? We had like four rebellions in a row that were brutally crushed by the U.S. states in a very authoritarian manner. I would not consider those pr to particularly live up to the full ideals of american freedom now that doesn't mean that i think that like america's like 100 good or 100 bad but the problem is is that we have a tendency to um yeah, shay's rebellion whiskey rebellion a bunch of them um but we have um plenty of examples of things not working out so great according to the ideals and then the outcomes are not also not perfect history is bloody and messy i don't think there's any there's a there's a tendency to always want to whitewash um the society that you live in and i don't think that that's really good for t for conversations um uh you know th not a great uh, a great discussion point in my opinion because it's just there's too much that's overlooked and whitewashed out of it and then um there was a third point which was discussing um the sort of idea of liberty um and and et cetera, et cetera, as far as how you actually implement these things the fact of the matter there will always be people who are going to disagree um with various policies that are put into place that's the case from everything from you know your local uh, chicken uh regulations to anything there's always going to be people that doesn't necessarily mean there will be violent conflict over every single thing and i do believe that there are many ways for us to take um and in fact uh you know i'm hoping that we do take a uh, very radical um um approaches towards changing the way that our country is running because i don't know again i don't want to go back to the COVID issue but we have over six hundred thousand dead americans and that is shocking that is a shocking situation and our economy is going to be facing an unprecedented change if we're not willing to to address and accept the potential for new ideas especially okay. new ideas that are yep. socially Thank minded you, yeah all right we'll go to rob and then uh, connor and then whichever left he wants to go okay um so just to respond to connor and kind of demon mama a little there i, I agree with your point on revolutions right the outcome is what we look at not the ideals the point i'm trying to make is show me one socialist revolution that ended positively show me one show me a capitalist it hasn't revolution happened everyone positively right uh so i would argue again it is uh, it is we have never had a socialist country. Would anyone disagree with this point? Any of the three of you? Uh, this is the greatest time in the history of the world to be alive. Probably, that is yeah. an incredibly difficult question to answer. And also, doesn't well, I really, think by almost, really probably for almost think, anyone, yeah. All right. Well, What's the that? reason I bring it well, up yeah, is because we've had that, wait. Well, hold on okay. a second. I would argue that that is there is some truth to that, but that but like it de totally depends on the person, right? Like I don't think that this is probably the best time in history to to live in Iraq. Like it's probably not the best time in in the world to live in in certain places. But the yeah, and also for like ninety five percent of people, okay. I think the case sure. Holds true, but that's though. but that's fine. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. But that's but that's yeah. really really that's not like relevant at all even if it is the okay best anyways thing. Wait, wait, i'll wait, explain wait, how it's if relevant it's, if explain. it's not if holy listen. you've had the bulk of the time like but you you I, asked yeah, a question, there, uh, you asked a question and i said i disagreed so you can't just right but it, it was this simple with everyone me, else Everyone okay, else so, managed so this to answer in a do. timely fashion. So can if I could just finish my point real quick. So uh, the reason I bring this yeah, up is because there's been a, a lot of revolutions that have led to the point where we're at now and has led to a lot of the advancements that have made, like advancements in medicine, advances in food production, advancements in housing and technologies that have improved, not just the life expectancy of people. Like one of the stats that I remember hearing was in sub-Saharan Africa, the poorest, punch, uh, the poorest countries in the world right now, there, uh, I always screw this term up, but the um, successful birth rate, so of not having the mother or the baby die during, die during childbirth, their rates Infant in sub-Saharan Africa right now are exactly the rates of the UK in 1975. That is an incredible achievement. The amount of people that aren't in crippling poverty. Remember, in the 1800s, we had people like Malta is telling us that the max capacity of the yeah, United States was 2 billion people. Technology. We're I now agree. feeding more people than ever. Uh, the life expectancy is better than ever. All of this stuff, it's going very well. And there have been a lot of revolutions that have led to this point. However, I've yet to see one successful socialist revolution. That's why I make the claim. Uh, real quick, just the other thing I wanted to say on this is uh, what we're ignoring here is to have the sort of socialism that Demon Mom is suggesting would require, as Connor points is saying, a use of force that would be incredible. You would have to take private property and ownership of people away from them. And I do not see how that's justified. If you've worked, whether you are at the top of this hierarchy through your achievement or other means, it is disastrous to force that totally to be eliminated from you by a government that we could see already 
already in the United States, particularly, but in general in other countries that doesn't always know how to manage every resource or every section of the economy as successfully as private industries do. And I would point to you, since we've already admitted that there's not a country that is total workers owns a means of production and Instead, we're talking about mixed economies and policies that have leaned more in that direction. If we're looking at the United States general, can we think of a policy that's occurred recently that was a mass uh, collecting of people's resources in the form of taxation and then spending it? Yes, we can. The stimulus, which we've had, what, over four or five trillion at this point, it has been one of the largest redistribution schemes from the poor and working class to the upper class that we've seen in such a short period of time in this country's history. You so when the, the government got when Trump? the government got involved and printed or collected money and then redistributed it as is a socialist type policy, it has massively enriched the same elite people that socialists claim that they're trying to take this power away from. Uh, I don't think that's the case for stimulus. So, okay, so try and focus a bit on the revolution argument. Sorry, go ahead, aftershock. Yeah, sorry about um so uh Connor, Connor's been waiting for a while, and then Demon Mama, you'll get to you'll get to uh respond to all of that. Well, and so she's in done left. You. I want to hear yeah, yeah. I'd like yeah, to hear sure. Okay, uh I can okay, wait. Let's, do, let's okay. Happy cool, to wait. Yeah. Sure. So, so done I, left. Connor points to Demon Mama. So I don't think the stimulus thing is true. I'm pretty sure that most distributional analyses have found that it like enormously benefits the poor. I, that's like a sub debate that we can talk about. I don't think that even were it the case that this example of redistribution were like pro rich, that this would mean that redistribution is generally a poor policy. I, I guess to focus on the general question, um, the, I am no revolutionary. I'm a reformist. However, I think that the problem with pointing to past historical examples as you do is that it doesn't one fit the model that Demon Mom is using. Um, the models that she would point to would lead to presumably more of the, the examples that we see in the Zapatistas in Rojava, um, where they they had a more libertarian socialist model, and they don't seem to have like fallen into you know extreme autocracy. Um, if anything, they seem to be like reasonably well functioning democracies or close to it. Yep. Um, so I, I think that it, for that measure of success, I don't think that it's fair to paint Demon Mama's model as unsuccessful. Um, however, I don't think that revolutions like that are very successful in general. Um, so that's why I'm a reformist. I don't think that we're going to see it in the first world. There's never been a successful revolution in the in any first world country ever. Which is why I keep trying to point to as a modern socialist model a more reformist model. That's why I point to people like Bernstein. That's why I point to, if you wanted to look to other people, it'd be like um, David Schweikart. Um, and all of and, and the arguments there are, we need to build out the capacity of democracy. We need to build out the capacity of the state and th use that to build a socialist model with the things that we're talking about, um, like trying to reduce the wealth of the capitalists and distribute to everyone else, trying to increase the control of democracy over like investment and what the economy um, chooses to invest in. I, and the last I thing Disney I would just say, um, sorry, I know I'm going on for a bit, um, is a no, lot no, of those no. success stories in the third world come from research. Like the Green Revolution was enormously important for that feeding of the world. And the Green Revolution in part came from a lot of state investment in agricultural research. Yep. The modern uh, medicine revolution that we're going to see from mRNA research comes from heavy state investment. Right Tesla was created by state investment. I think it really... I, I think in short, it's hard to just give this victory over to capitalism when a lot of these socialist bits that we socialists like That's were right. heavily involved in sense success. I think Destiny's a good, a good debater. All right, Connor, and then we'll go to Demon Mama. Himself. Yeah, um, so I actually did have a conversation with this, uh, or conversation oh, with some lefties the other day. It was pretty good. Me um, streaming and I just wanted to con Rob maybe not concede something, but ju just say like a point of agreement. I think that... that the reason why I'm a mixed economy capitalist, the reason why I'm a centrist in, in these regards is because I do think that there's things that the government doesn't do well, or, or not not the government doesn't do well. I think there's things that the market doesn't do well. Um, so for instance, there are some things that we should do research and development on that just do not have a market incentive. Um, you know, wh whether that's like healthcare oh, okay. research, whether that's like space research, whether or not that's, um, you know, Hello. basically high technology research. Hey, there are some me. things that like basically should not be left up solely to the market. The military is another example that I don't think should be exclusively privatized. I think that should be a public good that we all invest in. Um, infrastructure, healthcare. There, there's a few things that the government does that like, I'm not saying they do it well, but I am saying efficiency is not the only metric because you if you if your solution is an efficient system that doesn't achieve the results you want or an inefficient system that actually achieves the results you want i would rather take the inefficient system um all right so uh then i have like seven points that way uh you guys can uh, get some rocket fuel okay uh, uh so i just want to point now to everybody in chat that uh socialism done left said i am no revolutionary i'm a reformist uh that basically makes him a fucking liberal so you need to attack him so there True. we go <laughs> second point um rojava so one of the things that's like um i'm gonna throw contrapoints under the bus um so fucking contrapoints had this like a uh, debate between like uh, a cat a cat girl and like i don't know like a sock dem or something like that it was one of her dialogues and, and basically uh one of the things was like hey what where, where's an example of like socialism working out and uh you know the cat girl Ta tabby's her name uh tabby goes 
oh, well, between 1910 and 1912, there was this beautiful revolution and, you know, uh, revolutionary Cambodia and it was blah, 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 blah. And it's like, it's like, fuck guys, like is the best metric for success, like a two year fucking experiment in the butt fuck of nowhere? Like, is that the best thing that we have as an example? You can respond in a minute. Fucking, and like Rajava very specifically, it's probably pretty easy to be communal when your total amount of like public resources to, to divide is like maybe some like defunct fucking oil fields and a couple of fucking rocks. Like it's probably pretty fucking easy to divide that shit. All right, now you were talking about whitewashing of fucking people, okay? You were talking about how uh, basically Americans like whitewash their own fucking history, but the you know we we don't or we pay too much attention to what happens over le uh, lefties. What you brought up as like moderates for like uh, like left like <laughs> moderate lefties was Hassan Piker, the guy who said that America deserved 9/11 and that Dan Crenshaw deserved to get his eye hole fucked out. The other person that sure, you but he's up, no tanky. Come on, man. Yeah, come on. That's like you're just that's I, literally character assassination. I'll, I'll, I'll let you sorry. finish. I'm sorry. I have my problem. I'm with just Hassan, repeating but... his words. All right, all right. So, and then my other person, this is character assassination because I like Bosch dearly. Uh, but like, uh, you know, also like Israel deserved to be glass and like conservatives are fucking Nazis. Like these are your moderates, okay? So like, uh, yeah, okay. If they didn't want me to fucking talk about it, they didn't have to fucking say it. All right, anyways. All right, final final point on whitewashing, then I can yield and you guys can do what you want to do. All right, so you, you mentioned whitewashing and you said like uh, sometimes leftist or socialist revolutions have outcomes that are less than ideal. Yeah, less than ideal is a really whitewashy way to fucking put it, okay? If we're talking about like the Cambodian Khmer, I don't know, genociding 20% of the population of Cambodia, if we're talking about Mao Zedong in 1972, dragging out half a million capitalist sympathizers and killing them in the streets, yeah, I would say that's less than ideal. But it's on par with like some of the worst atrocities in human history. And if you look at the fucking 20th century, it's pretty clear where these things are occurring repeatedly and they're authoritarian socialist regimes. So until you break up that concentration of like oh. oligarchical state capitalist power, I am not interested in the socialist project. You have to tell me how socialism is going to avoid these pitfalls. God, there was like so much, uh, like, I feel like we've been on like a record, the skipping back and back and back. It's like, like, I, I like, do you think I'm a Maoist? Like, what the fuck? Like, I've literally explicitly, okay. wait, wait, okay, wait, so no, no, what... stop, stop, stop. Listen, I've addressed this point like three times and you keep bringing it up. What I'm talking about is what, it, this is you what I'm going to we can we can do this right now. The the thing that that Rob brought up that I referenced about whitewashing, um, is stuff like this. See, America, uh, America had a, a revolution, a capitalist revolution, and now we have computers and the internet. If you, that's not how these things work. America, even by Rob's own words here, has some socially minded policies, and as it turns out, those socially minded policies have given us a huge amount of benefit. So. I don't think that anybody here would argue that America is a purely capitalist country. That's ridiculous. There is no such thing. We don't have any, there is no country in the world that is a single, you got your seven points out. I got, I'm going to get mine out. Um, no, I, I want to, I want to hear it, but I want to ask you a very specific question. Okay, when you're if you done. have a specific question, go ahead and I'll address it with this part. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's not my main question. My main, my very main question that I would like you and SDL to address mm -hmm. is how will the socialist revolutions of the future address the concentration of state power that seems inherent in socialist revolutions. Yes. Oh, it's super easy by not following a Marxist Leninist plan. That's the way you do it. That's so instead okay. of a negative so definition, super... I think the, the yeah, positive no, definition not good is more horizontalization of power. The reason I pointed to Bernstein, the reason I pointed to Schweikart is they focus on economic democracy. The reason I pointed to Adramoglu is they pointed to like democracy as an institution. You need to, when you build out state power, also build out democratic power. For example, they point to building out extra state actors like unions and like political parties, which have the ability to force the state to heal. Yeah, Real quick, guys. Also, uh, Demon notice... Mama did not get a chance to respond. Yeah, to, 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 sorry. No, it's good. It's good. I actually really appreciate you coming in on that. I, I agree very strongly on that, by the way. Um, while I don't really, uh, I'm not like a, a massive theory head, um, like the, the fact of the matter is that like 
there is uh there is a selective there is a selectiveness that goes on um when people are trying to make arguments in one way and i could i could do the same thing by the way i could talk about oh yes as we can see in the 19 1900s the worst uh you know the worst re re you know revolution of all time was you know hitler's the rise of hitler's nazi party which which g grossly fused the state with pr private property in a highly capitalistic manner yeah and uh we could we could mm -hmm. easily we could socialism <laughs> we could easily easily play those types of games all day but what we're trying to do is actually reach some sort of sense here right so when we're talking about this i do not believe in centralized power however i do recognize that there is going to be some imperfections i don't think that you can just snap your fingers and click america into a perfectly non-hierarchical system as i would agree with we're going to have to work in and out in and outside of those hierarchical systems in order to advance change um and i believe very strongly personally um in a approach of um, while not, I would not call this sort of reformism, I call it, let's say, cultural revolution. I believe that we need to convince people of this, these ideas, show that these ideas work, and that people will simply accept them as time goes on. Literally, it's super, super, in my opinion, this is how we've seen things. Want a great example of this? The civil rights movement, a, a movement that was predominantly left in its nature, that made a massive argument, a huge stand for itself, and that showed that the culture had changed that we are no longer going back to the way that it was. People will be free. And I believe that movements like that are what are going to change us in the modern era. Those are the types of quote unquote revolutions that we like to see because they, revol they involve people saying, no, we demand our democratic rights. We demand our freedom. And if that means we have to stand in, in, in protest uh, out of the White House, that's great. So that's the type of thing that I would look for when I talk about change. But with regard to structures, I believe very strongly in limiting government power um via actually building democratic structures the united states government we could talk about this all day the number of ways in which the united states government doesn't actually do a very good job at representing democracy and i believe that we would naturally trend towards a more socialistic output um, if we had a more demo democratic system right now, a lot of the hangers on to anti-democracy, both in, in our economic approach and in our general country's approach to the way that we handle civil rights, the way that we handle war is very anti-democratic. And I don't like that. And I think that one of the big problems that we saw with places like, say, Russia and China, if you want to choose those two as an example that we have to talk about, well, you'll notice these were highly, highly rigid, highly centralized systems that, in my opinion, and my biggest criticism, I've literally debated this with tankies, is that there is no, within that structure, there is no other possible outcome except for inevitably someone to inherit uh, a, 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 the amount or to inherit power that will corrupt them. Because if you centralize a system like that, then that's going to be the inevitable outcome. You have to have a system that prevents that. And the way you do that is through through strong democratization. So um, I, I would love to keep this conversation going, but we're running out of time. So what we'll do is uh, Rob, Connor, give your quick give your quick uh, two cents on that. And then we'll go to Demon Mama, Socked and Left. And then we'll, we'll go into closing statements after you two get your thoughts in. OK, so uh, go ahead, Rob, and then Connor. And then we'll go to the left. Okay. Well, the, the two things real quick. Uh, one, it's impossible to achieve uh, workers owning the means of production without centralized government. It's just a pipe dream. It's not possible. Second, uh, oh. we can see that if that was somehow possible, what you're doing is disincentivizing people that would be at the top of these hierarchies. And the reality is hierarchies good. are inevitable and they're good. So, for example, if you said that we'll just have if we had more democracy, we would have more socialism. Yes, this is the old conundrum of if 51 percent of the people voted for the 49% of the other people's wealth, then yeah, I guess that that would be a form of socialism. So if a bunch of people say, no, 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 we don't think that there should be private business ownership. We want all of that wealth. Well, we could see how systems like that worked out. You lose specialization that's needed to make those companies or the ideas and the good things that are coming from them uh, operate. Right. That's how we saw the mass starvation that occurred in the Holodomir uh, uh, with in the Ukraine. For example, they kicked out. They said they went to a bunch of people and they said, it's not fair that these kulaks own all of these farms. Why don't we kick them out? And the people said, yeah, yeah, you're right. Why? We should have democracy. The majority of us vote that they shouldn't own this. And so they took the production away from those kulaks. And the problem was they didn't know how to farm. As a result, tens of millions of Ukrainians starved to death. This is what happens when you disincentivize specialization and expertise. It's impossible to get rid of hierarchies. And all attempts to eliminate hierarchies totally like this will meet with disaster. Real 
quick on Sushdan's left's points. Um, look, you cited things. I've said that I'm for sort of a mixed economy. The things you cited when we're talking about systems that are alleviating poverty and things like that, you say, well, yeah, research. Yeah, I don't think anyone in here has argued that we shouldn't have sort of a collective welfare or collective resources being put towards research and things like that. The problem is how do you implement that research and the way you implement that research is people have a commodification mindset, which encouraged them to produce more and more food, which is what lifted people out of poverty and starvation. No, so yeah, the idea, like no one's saying, uh, like you seem to be saying, well, because collectively we came together and we had ideas and scientists that proved socialism. No, that proved that there was a spot for education in how we, uh, having sort of a socialized education, which is a system that occurs almost everywhere in every first world country. Um, the, I had more to say on centralization, but I, we don't have much time, so I'll yield to Connor. Yeah, we're running low on time. Connor, go ahead. Yeah, I'll try to be quick. Um, so uh, basically, the horse, horse, what I heard was horse, horizontalization of power through private economic democratic organization. So basically, unions or uh, sy syndicates or something like that. I don't have a fucking problem with that. Uh, like I said, Publix, one of the best grocery stores stores in the Southeast um, is privately owned, but all of the stock is distributed through the employees. I'll actually uh, explain that a little bit more in, in a second. Uh, cultural advancement through public advocacy. I don't give a fuck if 500 to 1,000 years from now, we have fusion power in mass autom automation that pushes everybody out of the workforce. And now the economy is producing so many goods, but because we've tied income with working, there's no people to consume the goods. So we give everybody fucking UBI and then we all fucking consume and we're we're all in gay luxury space communism and all that kind of shit i don't give a fuck once we technologically get there but we don't have fusion and we don't have automation throwing everybody out on their ass and chances are there are still jobs to do so i'm okay with mixed economy capitalism um as it works right now um i'm a liberal so basically you guys advocating on a cultural level for the things that you believe in this fits into my framework uh um perfectly fine and then uh rob brought up how to how to have worker owns own the mean production or own the means of production without government Publix, okay? It's literally a private business. They redistribute their stock to their uh, to their employees. There are literally people who have physical and mental disabilities who are retiring as hundred like high hundred thousandaire or millionaires because they basically distributed uh, private stock to their employees. Um, and then yeah, real this quick, is, this can, thing. So you can is, see that the key point here is though that like you under our system, you have the option to do that. If we have a system with total worker-owned means of production, you would not have the right to have private property as a means of production, correct? Correct. We we can we can. Uh, I don't want to open up a can of worms, so we can talk about that next time. Uh, but fi fi next time, fi uh, final point. Um, so when you use words like cultural revolution. I'm not sure if you're aware of like the historical context of cultural revolution, but the historical event that in 1972 where half a million people who were capitalist sympathizers were dragged out of the street and killed, that was called the cultural revolution. Uh, Hassan Piker, despite not being a tanky, uh, seems to defend flying the hammer and sickle. So no, like, like it's kind of like, if, if, a, if I was flying like the swastika behind me and I'm like, I'm not a fascist, or if I was flying the America first flag behind me and I was like, listen, I'm not, a groiper i don't know what you're talking about i just think that we need to limit immigration in a common sense way i would be kind of calling bullshit on it okay so this entire conversation boils down to the meme i like you but i'm scared of that guy and then the fucking the person who's up front is like i don't even know that guy and then the person behind him is like look at me brother that's exactly what this shit is, okay? You guys are the fucking libertarian face to a nefarious fucking movement. You don't want to admit that there's nefarious aspects to it. And that's fine. We can argue about it this time, yeah, next time, definitely, whatever definitely you fucking should, feel like. Because that's a lot of that's a lot of accusations. You kinda like you kind of ran up the clock there <laughs> with those accusations. I am perfectly fine with accusing Hassan I mean, Piker of being you an literally asshole. just do? Didn't you literally just do cut a libertarian socialist and a Maoist bleeds, like, but just the reverse? Didn't you just reverse so Uno, the thing you were no. just announcing a little bit ago? No, it I said, no, like I said, all right, all right, all right, all right. <laughs> last point, last point. I said, I like you guys, but I'm scared of that guy. So and I, you, no, I didn't you, say that. what'd you say after that? That Hassan Piker's That we're the libertarian face of a horrifying regime. That's literally the same thing, and you All know All right, it. and with that, and with that. Okay, cool. So uh, I'm going to pick a card. Red is going to be left. Black is going to be right. Whoever wins gets the last word. Just, we'll do it that, just so there's no, like, favoritism well, or anything le like that. Le yeah, lefties, like... Haven't, lefties haven't gone yet. Yeah, no, I know, for the final comment. Yeah, closing. Oh. Yeah, yeah, okay, so red is left.
Okay, red. Okay, so lefties go first. So, uh, oh, red, uh, Rob, go ahead. <laughs> Rob, go ahead and go first, and then we'll go to uh, Sockton left counterpoints, and then Demon Mama. Okay, oh, so that, we got what a minute? We have uh, a yeah, minute. two minutes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. So, uh, yeah. So I think the problem is, again, uh, they can't point to any society that's been a total worker owned means of production. Uh, every time that we've tried to have that total owned worker owned means of production, it's resulted in a disaster, as Counterpoints was just talking about with Red China, uh, with the Soviet Union, with the Kulaks. Uh, you do things like you disincentivize hierarchies, which means that we will not have the great advancements that we've seen. They've conceded that basically they've conceded that now is the greatest time to be alive. Although there have been some mixed economy benefits of having collectivization that has resulted in some of these good things. Overwhelmingly, the things like private property and a for-profit mentality is what's led to the mass alleviation of starvation and alleviation of poverty we've seen around the world. Look, capitalism isn't a perfect system. I, I get that. But the problem is, as Counterpoints is also arguing here, socialism is talking about this centralized power. Uh, he talks about things like unions and things like that. Yeah, that's good, but that could all occur in our mixed economy. The problem is with people like Demon Mama that are saying we should force that people can't have private ownership of these companies. That's what the problem is. And what happens is, even though they seem reasonable now, I wish I could talk more specifically about some of their beliefs. The problem is, when you give people so much incredible power, that they're able to do that to force people to not have ownership and to steal their private property they've had it inevitably could lead to all sorts of terrible things which is why we've seen it occur over and over and counterpoints is right that we see people advocating for that so as jordan peterson has said many times that the problem is if you're the type of person that says if i just had total control and if my ideology had total control to be able to enforce taking away people's stuff and things like that then everything would go great the problem is that's what every authoritarian dictator in history has said and it leads to bloodbaths that's why we should prefer personal freedom personal freedom is fantastic it's what's made the united states one of the best countries in the history of the world there is definitely room for a mixed economy i don't disagree with that but i think that the embracement of socialism in the way that we hear being advocated here would be a disaster that would strip people of their rights lead to a bloodbath and would be ineffectual and would cause businesses to collapse, cause the economy to collapse and make all of our lives what the worse. Fuck? All right. Sock done left. Go ahead. Two minutes. Sure. So the two points that I kind of want to get at before as a response before the final statement. One, um, the idea that hierarchies are natural or inevitable, I'd agree with to some extent. However, the fact that some hierarchies are natural does not mean that all hierarchies are. And more generally, this does not mean that most hierarchies that currently exist are justified or useful for society. In fact, the idea that hierarchies are inevitable is something that both Engels and Hayek would agree on. Um, the, the idea here is that merely because hierarchies must exist to coordinate modern, highly complicated industrial production does not mean that those hierarchies can't be done in a democratic fashion, i.e. democracy within the workplace or democracy of the overall economy. There's little to no reason to believe that that is the case. Uh, this is precisely the argument that I would argue that you see in cases like Matsukudo, um, where you can certainly have lots of heavy state investment in um, research and development and in the economy overall, helping to shape those market hierarchies to be more effective for society overall. This kind of links to the second argument about the research only comes from this commodification mindset. I think this is exactly wrong. Um, if anything, uh, as I've tried to point out repeatedly throughout this argument, there's a decent chunk of evidence to believe that public investment in R&D is not only more useful than private research and development, but necessary because there are theoretical reasons to believe that capitalism persistently underinvests in research and development relative to what is socially optimal because research and development benefits society as a whole, but you as a capitalist can only make profit on what benefits you and your business in particular. Um, that's the very short reason, and there's many, many more theoretical reasons as to why that'd be the case. It's something that we observe naturally as well. It's why the state has to have such a large role in research and development in particular. Um, and I think that the arguments for that don't necessarily apply to the rest of the economy, but other arguments do apply there, which is why I'm appealing to, if you want a book, um, it would be After Capitalism by David Schweikart. Um, so I guess as a, the summary of the arguments for socialism, it'd be the ones that I raised at the start, is that fundamentally, I want to see economic democracy. I want to see democracy in the workplace. I want to see macroeconomic democracy, meaning more democracy of investment. Um, and then I want to see the removal of the shift of that prosperity from uh, market oriented, not market oriented, like free market um, competition and firms uh, innovating and growing and so on, uh, not seeing that accumulate to a very small group of people, but going to society as a whole, the abolition of the capitalist class, um, not through violence, but through redistribution and the, the change of the ownership. Um, so in short, I think those would guarantee a life, better life for virtually everyone on earth. All right, Connor points, go ahead, two minutes. Yeah, um, I made a majority of my, my points in the past. Uh, I think if the material conditions were different, um, if we had fusion power, if we had automation throwing people out on their ass to the point that they couldn't be gainfully employed, then I might be more of a socialist. I don't think that's happening. I don't think that's happening for probably another 200 to 300 years. Uh, you can, If uh, somehow I extend my life that far, you can talk to me about luxury gay space, gay space communism in 200 years. Um, but 
Uh, that being said, I appreciate, um, you know, uh, libertarian socialists, anarcho-communists, you fit within the liberal framework, so there's no reason for us to uh, fight to the death right now. Um, the only thing that I would reject, Demon Mama, I wouldn't say, like, I would have to poke around in your brain. We would have to have a longer conversation to figure out whether or not I thought you were actually truly libertarian, truly anarchist, um, or whether or not it was a veil through which to advocate for more authoritarian stuff. Come on after. My, my jab... Okay. All right. Cool. Uh, on, may, maybe not tonight, but in oh, okay. In, in general, yes. Uh, no, I I'm a boomer. It's fucking late. <laughs> True. <laughs> um. So yeah. So uh, Jesus Christ. All right. But in the case of Hassan, no, I feel perfectly fucking comfortable with my categorizations of his fucking politics likely being more authoritarian than he he or his audience want to pretend they are. So uh, with that, I'll yield. Bye. All right, Demon Mama, go ahead. Two minutes. All right, yeah. So there's just there's been a lot of uh, sort of vague appeals to uh, an ahistorical representation of how things came to be. The internet is one of the great examples of of one of the most important developments ever that was developed almost entirely through public R and D. Um, likewise, most medical uh, most medical achievements are developed through public R and D, which is often later bought up by private firms or um, is uh, is tossed around as a result of our very, very complicated uh, IP, intellectual property system. Um, the idea that, that redistribution must be done by force is completely silly. Um, in fact, uh, it would be, I, I would argue, that that if people, if uh, the capitalists that are currently in charge really wanted to see a better world, that they would willingly say, hey, maybe we shouldn't be sitting on all this money. And also, um, people are, are, are laughing as though, um, or, or Rob specifically was laughing as though um, there is something uh, wrong with the idea that the, that the workers should be able to have what they're entitled to. Yes, anything else is theft. And I do agree that our current system comp uh, is, is made up of not only a massive amount of, act of just raw wage theft, but that as it currently stands, workers get almost nothing of what they actually produce. Produce, like to a ridiculous degree so yeah the, the status quo in the u.s is one of mass theft from workers so i would stand against that i believe that the workers of america deserve much more than what they're getting significantly more and the best way to do that would be to get rid of this weird position of these ceos who sit on top of millions upon millions of dollars and do nothing um and yeah, uh, with regard to a couple statements that were made about personal freedom, I do think it's very odd to be advocating for personal freedom, but saying that hierarchies are actually good. I think that that's a little bit contradictory. Um, and to address one last thing, the idea of the world is better now. The world is better now because we are able to communicate with each other better, because we've been able to develop technologies that are shared freely across the world, because there's a lot of medicines that have been made public and available. That's what makes the world a better place. All humans living together better. All right. That was a great discussion, guys. I wish we had more time. It was great. Very, very informative. Uh, so uh, let's get let's take some questions from the audience really quickly. Um, just to save time, uh, whoever it's directed to, they get to answer. And the and usually I left the left or right, uh, whichever the opposition is, uh, maybe respond if they want to. But just save on time. We're not nope, going to do that. Topic. So um, Angie One Kyle 74 asks, should the federal government had have standing to impede on the state laws for gun control and why? And I'm guessing this is the, these are for the left, uh, the lefty panelists. Uh, so whoever wants to answer that can. What oh. does this have to do with socialism? <laughs> is that the uh, next was that a question about the first just, or is that for the second? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I guess, yeah, I guess we could skip, but I guess it was kind of, okay. Uh, Dirty Bird Stiller says if they leftists claim that, oh, or leftists in, in the parentheses, uh, claim that m uh, money can be printed at will to give stimulus, etc., why do we need to take money from the wealthy to, to redistribute? Sure. That position is called MMT uh, or an extreme, often hyperbolic version of MMT that you can just print money with abandon because the government can set whatever the price of money is. I think that even MMTers don't actually believe that. They just believe that the government can set the value of money within like a really high like uh, boundary of how much money you print. And then more mainstream economics sets a smaller boundary for how much money you can print without like ex extreme and insane inflation. Uh, so the short answer is we can't do that because MMT isn't true. It's like a more bounded truth. And even within MMT, there's still bounds. Um, so like, this is just a straw man of a subsection of the left that most lefties, as far as I'm aware, don't believe. 
Gotcha. And just to, just to, oh yeah, go ahead, Demon Mama. Oh know, yeah, know. to respond to that, um, when we're talking about these things, often money is used as shorthand for resources. Um, we're not just talking about literal cash. We're talking about the fact that um, you can have a, a company like Amazon, even if you don't have a single capitalist at the top, you could have a company like Amazon or a company like Google or a company like Comcast that can control so much actual resources that it is a to a detriment of this to the society as a whole the society that they need in order to be able to do business it's not a it's not a particularly complex um concept to believe that like hey you wouldn't be able to do business if the society didn't exist so you shouldn't be able to hold up society and by the way they do do that um there was a massive push here in washington um to pass taxes on amazon because uh, I don't know if you've ever been out to Seattle, but uh, like you go out and there are just constant Amazon trucks all over the road. Their distribution centers are all over here. They use a, an incredible amount of resource. They employ an unbelievable amount of people for comparatively pretty low wages. And uh, and so as a result, there was a push to increase the taxes on them. They threatened to leave the state entirely. So yeah, I think that stuff like that is um, is a detriment to the society as a whole. Yeah. All right. And by the way, some of these questions might be, you know, very, very, uh, you know, weighted in bad faith. You, you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. You can just say, fuck you, your bad faith and not answer it if you don't want to. Uh, PB Success asks, uh, thank you for hosting the debate. Uh, my question for the panel is, which is better for avoiding climate change, socialism or capitalism? And that's for everybody. We all know the answer to that question. Sure. So I'm kind of optimistic on... I'm optimistic on green growth in general. Um, I think that some of the best uh, movements on green technology that we've seen have resulted from public investment. I pointed before, um, so everyone knows Solyndra because it failed, but everyone forgets the enormous successes of other solar panel production technologies and companies that were part of the Obama era stimulus to green tech. And I hope that we're going to see the exact same thing, part of the modern green revolution of a possible third industrial wave due to heavy state investment in the green sector. Um, so I think that more socialist policies make it more successful, but I think that I hope that there can still be a green growth under capitalism. I disagree that making, yeah, well, I guess I don't disagree with the end part there, the more I hear about it. Uh, so here's the deal, right? Like, we also understand that capitalism, first off, there's this, this debate about how severe climate change is and what the status quo would be in order to solve it. So the status quo seems to be doing a good job reducing emissions to the point that we used to say, for example, there was a protocol called the Kyoto Protocol that was suggested in 2006 that said we needed to reduce emissions from 2000 levels to 20 by 20% 20 by 2020. The Paris Climate Accord, the United States, despite Trump pulling out of it, is on path to meet their emission standards that we had. Uh, this has largely to do with us being a more capitalist system than the countries that we see that are more socialist, like Demon Mama and SDL have talked about. Why is it that France and Spain and Italy and the UK and countries that have more socialism than the United States are doing a poorer job under the Paris France has done incredibly Accord well. Than a it's almost completely decarbonified energy sector via, nu via nuclear. Sorry to interrupt. About? About? I'll, have yeah. to I, I'll have to check. I'll have to check. I believe I, I believe I read that they had not met the uh, the goals set forth. Uh, so I'll check that out. Perhaps you're right. I'd look forward to you sending me evidence. But the point is this: uh, even under capitalism, we could see things like in a capitalist system that we are seeing people understand. It. The truth is, people are smart. Investors are smart. Innovators are smart. And innovation comes primarily through capitalism. Even though there is a place for R and D and socialism of that nature. The reality is most of our advancements come from innovation for people seeking a commodification and for-profit mindset. So people could see the writing on the wall that there's going to be a benefit for green energy. And so we see these companies going out on their own to develop these technologies in part because they want to profit from them. And the other part is we're only in all of these conversations that SDLs talk about the problem is he's only talking about the research and development. He's not talking about the implementation and people actually go out and doing these things. So you could develop farming technology as best you want if people don't know how to properly use it. The truth is the people that have provided the food for the bulk of the world are people that are for-profit capitalist people. They're the ones that have gone out there for a profit margin and it's been a benefit because it's fed people around the world. The same is true that we're seeing of green energy and if it's ever going to be implemented successfully, we need the government out of the way. Part of the problem wrong, is the government socializing wrong. by giving subsidies Not to gasoline companies and fossil fuel companies. So we can see that it cuts both ways. It's not as simple as socialism solves climate change best. Can I touch on that Connor? one? That was a Oh, okay. Sure, we'll go to uh, no, no, no rebuttals. We can't have. I'm trying to respect everybody's time on the panel. And that's why. So sorry, I I, I'm sorry, but yeah, panel, that's fine. No, no yeah, you it, can answer it, the, the, okay. the question. Can... Just don't rebut, like you know, because then it's going to cascade into like a back and forth. You can uh, you can answer the question though, but yeah, Connor, and then we'll go to Demon Mama. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah. So th this is where I get accused of being a, you know, fence sitting centrist or whatever. No, the, the whole reason why mixed economy capitalism is best is because there are failures. Uh, so, for instance, the the oil com oil companies have been disproportionately investing in basically like counter, uh, you know, counter global warming, climate change propaganda for about 50 years or whatever. It's not in their interest to invest in it. That being said, I do have people who work in that industry who know that uh, who are basically saying that the writing is on the wall, even in um, the fossil fuel industry, that even they are trying to diversify their holdings into green energy, new energy, all that kind of stuff. Um, so my thing is. When there's a market failure, the government has a duty to invest in R&D because I'm a pronatalist. I have a son. I want him to have children. I want them to live in a world that is I, I don't want them to have to create Martian bio bubbles that we all live in in fear of like category seven hurricanes and like all that kind of shit. Um, so, yeah, yield. Even mama, go ahead. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh the the obvious answer here is that a a more socially minded system um i think socialism would do a significantly better job dealing with this um and and the idea that like uh the private the private mar or the the private you know market uh, systems are going to do a good job with this they simply won't they haven't they've ignored it they've churned out like connor brought up massive amounts of propaganda um to, in fact trying to denounce some of which I, I i hate to say rob even brought up here um and uh and the fact of the matter is that the last major environmentalist push that we had was the new deal the New Deal is 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 part of the fucking reason that we even have um, unexploited natural spans in our country right now. That we have um, large infrastructure product projects in our country right now. So we need um, enormous projects, stuff like the Green New Deal, that I think would be really good. I think there's in fact room to go even further. Uh, I I can't. The, the problem that we have with the with the current capitalist system is it's incredibly short sighted, and um, you know a lot of these companies are mostly interested in in keeping above the line for their uh, you know to please their investors to please their questionably intelligent uh, uh, um, you know stockholders uh, shareholders, um, and I think that that leads to a short sightedness that is going to make it impossible for anyone to do anything. If we don't have a planet we can live on, then we can't do business we can't invent things we really need that and we are re we've been recognizing for some time now that the the state of our environment is so bad that if we don't take serious action if we don't do so you know willingly and maybe happily just say all right we got to do this we're going to be in a lot of trouble we're going to be in a lot of trouble and i don't want to be in a lot of trouble if we can avoid it all right, I provided guys. a link, by the way, SDL, I did provide a link that Paris is being sued by a Paris court for failing to meet the Paris climate goals. Sure. All right. All right. So, yeah. Let, dropping the, dropping just the one, thing. One okay, one cool. City. So now, yeah, for sure, for sure. Uh, so now, uh, second topic. Good Paris talk, by the way, guys. Friends. Very, very, very good. Uh, second topic. Uh, gun control. With right. the appalling gun violence in recent times, the topic of gun control has been heated, to say the least. Many Americans argue it's a God-given right to self-preservation, but man many Americans also argue that the kind of culture, that kind of culture has resulted in many unnecessary deaths. Thus, taking a second look at the Second Amendment is something we must do. Panelists, what do you think? Uh, since we started off with the right-leaning people first, let's go with Demon Mama, and then we'll back and forth. So go ahead, Demon Mama, two minutes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so... Uh, there is no doubting the fact that um, guns are unbelievably widespread in the United States. I personally do not believe that any sort of program that involves like mandatory gun buybacks or seizures um, is a good move or a smart move. Um, my general position on um, gun control uh, is that there the most of the value of gun control comes uh, or sorry most of the value of gun ownership comes from communal ownership um, and responsible ownership uh, most people are, um, are are not ever going to find themselves in a situation where they are John Rambo armed with two uh, you know f machine guns fighting off a, a siege of, of evil people um, but however knowing uh, much like having a dog can make it much less likely that you will get robbed um, be, being in an area that has a high level of gun ownership makes you much less likely to be the victim of certain crimes. Um, and there, uh, in, in general, I support uh, uh, a relative, you know, reasonable um, 
private gun ownership. I grew up in a state where most everyone had a gun. Almost every house had a gun in it. Hunting was very, very common. Um, subsistence or, um, or uh, what's it called? I can't remember what it when you add when you're adding to your income um was very 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 popular um and i do believe that uh gun culture in america should be strongly strongly challenged and reformed um because i think that we could have a healthier gun culture here where right now it's just out of control um and uh while I, I have some concerns with certain forms of gun control, I do believe there are other forms of gun control that can be implemented in a way that, that maximizes the rights while re, while preventing the guns falling into the wrong hands. Um, so I, I tend to have a kind of a nuanced position on gun control, but in general, I do support people's right to own guns. I just don't think we need to be absurd about it. I did recently have an argument with somebody about going as far as people owning grenades i hope nobody here is that far um but yeah i i think there's room to discuss gun control um and reasonable measures like closing certain loopholes um while still preserving people's right to own firearms yep all right nice uh rob nor go ahead two minutes yeah, gun control is a failure. Um, you have a right guaranteed in the Second Amendment to arm yourself and have access to guns. If people want gun control, it shouldn't be done like Biden's about to do through executive order. It is absolute nonsense. The executive branch is to enforce existing law, not to take away your rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution. Uh, if you want to change the Second Amendment, there is a process to do so, and that is passing an amendment. Uh, so all of these restrictions on gun uh, restrictions on gun ownership I think are ridiculous. Now, having said that, I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, I have people in my family that own a gun shop. We have some of the strictest background checks that occur in Pennsylvania. I really don't have a problem with the way these laws are applied in Pennsylvania. I do think that each state should be allowed to reasonably suggest things and how they're investigating, uh, have a reasonable, not very intrusive background check into who's purchasing guns. I don't have a problem with Pennsylvania doing that. The problem is that we see the people that want gun control, that they constantly want to chip away and go further than that. You see people that suggest certain types of guns should be expelled, but they don't have any articulation as to how to define those specific guns, and they know next to nothing about those guns. And lastly, we see that there's a concerted effort, in my belief, to try to disarm people that are law-abiding citizens. For example, we can see that the federal government routinely refuses to prosecute actual gun crimes of people that are felons, not allowed to purchase guns, that attempt to buy these guns. And yet we're talking about imposing laws on more people that probably also wouldn't be enforced. So in effect, what this is, is forcing law abiding people to not have gun ownership while the criminals continue to get the guns as they see fit. I think this is a disaster. And I think you could see with things like the McClowski's in St. Louis, that there is a concerted effort to disarm people in this country so that there could be a sort of mob rule or there could be a government tyranny because they know historically that if you're unable to defend yourself, then it's easier to take the rest of your rights away. And we can see, uh, I believe it was Representative Clyborne said that if we voted on the Bill of Rights today, the majority majority of Democrats would reject those Bill of Rights. So taking away your right to defend yourself is tantamount to taking away the rest of your rights, and we should not give that up. Okay, nice. Uh, socialism done left. Two minutes. Go ahead. Sure. So I think the basic argument on gun control breaks down to three areas. I think that there is the public safety harms, public safety benefits, sorry, not public safety, public health harms, public health benefits, and the political argument. So public health harms, I think, are fairly straightforward. There is an enormous amount of evidence that more guns lead to more suicide. Um, that's pretty unambiguous. Um, there is weaker but still very strong evidence that guns, more guns, lead to more homicide. Um, and so that is generally uh, from a slight increase possibly of overall homicide or overall violent crime, but mostly from converting violent crime to homicide. So non-lethal violent crime becomes lethal. Um, so again, I think the evidence there is pretty strong. I think accidents, mass shootings, they're important. They like, they, you know, they make people very scared and they're sad, but they're a small portion of overall gun deaths. Um, most of what we're talking about here is interpersonal violence, um, which guns seem to increase, um, either in like, like uh, interpersonal, like gang often related violence, or um, the other big thing is domestic related violence, um, which would go, which would still be there even if we ended the war on drugs, for example, um, and then suicide. So that's the public health harms. Public health benefits are self-defense. And I think the evidence there is incredibly weak in favor of guns as self-defense. Um, it really all comes down to a few studies where people say they use guns in self-defense but have very poor validation. I think the evidence is much stronger in the reverse direction, that when guns are used, they don't provide much self-defense for the few crimes that they could be used in any, uh, used in self-defense anyway. Finally, there's the political argument, uh, which is that guns might protect worker rights or people's political freedoms. Um, I'm, you know, I understand why people have concerns about this, particularly given our previous conversation. You know, Since we're socialists, we want to give the government all this power and, you know, 
democracy, all this power. I understand that. So this gets to the prescriptions. Generally, the stuff that I support is stuff like um, licensure, strong waiting periods. Um, I support trying to move to in the long run to enormously reducing the manufacture of guns and towards community ownership of guns. I would like to, you know, my dream utopia would be entirely community based ownership of guns. You go to the community armory to get your gun, but you don't have any so household gun ownership. Zero. That would be the dream. Nice. All right, uh, Connor points. Go ahead. Two minutes. God damn. All right. Um, so SDL gave me a lot, but I'll save it for the general conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I think the one thing that we can agree on is gun culture sucks um, in America. <laughs> Basically, you you walk into a store, you pass a background check, they hand you an AR-15 or a shotgun, uh, at least in the state of Florida, same day. If you're trying to buy a pistol, they wait three days. Um, you know, they, they hand you a slip of paper that says, uh, you know, if you don't store this safely, it could kill people. And then they tell you to be on your way. Uh, that's fucked up. Um, I think with rights come responsibilities. While I want people to have the right to have firearms, I also want them to be educated on that. Uh, this is where I'm probably going to lose the lefties. Um, I think we need to have civic education, basically meaning that we need to educate the public on their civic rights, responsibilities. Um, I also think we need to bring back home economics. So while we're teaching people how to poach an omelet, um, we should also basically be teaching people uh, how to handle guns safely. If you're anti-gun, you can literally be, the, the entire class can be, step away, this is the part that goes bang, call the cops. That's the whole class. Uh, but for people who um, are actually pro-gun, they could maybe learn some stuff. Um, I don't have any problems with sa uh, safety courses, safe storage, or civil liability if people elect not to do uh, safe storage. Um, I am okay with uh, making background checks universal as long as we divorce serial numbers um, from private sales. I'll be very happy to uh, talk about that later. Um, and then also in reference, uh, I would prefer it if the left focused on the material conditions, because in Switzerland, they have a shitload of guns. In a lot of other countries, they have a shitload of guns. So what are the material conditions that are causing people to kill the fuck out of each other inside America? Um, and I would love to talk about that. And then I have other examples, but I know I'm probably running out of time. So with that, I'll you. All right, guys. So before we go into a roundtable discussion, I just want to uh, make make some like a little bit of ground rules. Uh, let's try, and I'm going to try to enforce this as much as possible. Let's try to not do like seven or eight points at once because then the other person has to rebut all those eight points, and then someone else wants to get in, and it just you know it just leads to this you know uh, gritty kind of stuff. So uh, whoever wants to go ahead, just keep that in mind, and I'll uh, definitely try to enforce that. Go ahead. Yeah, Connor, just for the record, you haven't lost my very lefty chat uh, with your suggestions. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with the idea of including as a part of public education some level of gun education, especially here in the States. Even even for people like SDL who support, uh, you know, ultimately getting rid of guns, I still think that that sort of education, given how many guns are around, I mean, hell— uh, I grew up in a household full of guns. Uh, my dad was like literally the type of person, very, very paranoid. He had guns hidden all over the place. Um, and that is not a good way of doing things. It is the, that is the American John Rambo. Like, again, that sort of fantasy of like, you're going to fend off some invasion on your house. It's not going to happen. Just use gun safes, use gun locks. It's perfectly fine. Uh, in in 90% of situations where you would ever need a gun, you're going to be better off with your gun safe with it in your safe and or with it locked up uh, and it's going to prevent the much more likely uh uh chance that you hurt yourself or you hurt somebody else um now um i think that there are there are some concerns with certain approaches to gun control that i'm a little worried about for example um one uh, type of gun control I always get a little bit worried about is uh, is like this sort of focus on mental health checks. Well, I think there can certainly be some value there. There is a a problem with that. I think that it can lead to unfairly sti uh, uh, stigmatizing certain groups of people. For example, I am trans. I very much believe that trans people have the right to arm themselves should they so desire it um, based on the current laws of our country. And 10 years ago, actually less than 10 years ago, I would have been by any modern standard that advocates for mental health checks would have been considered n mentally ill, even though I'm not. Um, and yeah, that would be pretty lame. So I think we should be careful about that sort of thing. Okay, so the real quick, kind of on that point, kind of agreeing with Demon Mummy, remember the first attempts of gun control in this country were to say that the Second Amendment didn't apply to freed slaves. And there's a rich history of gun control trying to be applied to stop African Americans from owning guns. Uh, it was particularly important that African Americans own guns because when they were free slave, this might shock people to know, there were a lot of shitty people in this country that sought to do them harm. So 
So they, as much as anyone, I needed that lady. right don't, to defend themselves, their person, their risk. property. Don't do it if you're and they had a fun. Not only do we have a fundamental human right to be able to defend ourselves, but you have a constitutional Second Amendment right to be able to do so with the firearm. So that was very important in that context. Like the, some of the things I wanted to say to SDL, like so we have seen historical gun control bills in this country that the haven't worked. I'll the difference right is when we're trying to compare country to country, what we're not. Uh, no problem. Uh, when we're comparing country to country, it doesn't assume the reality of the situation of guns in the United States now. So it's almost impossible to eliminate the guns when there's so many guns in this country. And so we have to look at the success rate of gun control laws in this country. Again, I don't think you take into consideration we have gun laws that are currently not enforced by the federal government or almost not enforced. So why don't we start with enforcing the gun laws we already have on the books? that are designed to keep the most violent people from getting guns that have already been convicted of things like felonies and violent crimes before we pass more gun control legislation that we have no proof would be able to help people. I mean, sure. So the simple answer for why we do it is because we have evidence that when we do these laws, it helps people, it saves people's lives. So for example, one law that isn't on the books in a lot of states is the domestic violence restraining order gun relinquishment <laughs> requirement, which is a mouthful, just call it DRVO. Um, uh, D DRVO related laws um, significantly reduce domestic violence escalating to domestic killing uh, inter called like partner hom homicide or intimate partner homicide. Um, so when we add those laws to the books, they save people. Um, it's, it's kind of as simple as that. Um, so maybe we should also be enforcing existing laws, but to me, this is not an either or, either new laws or old laws, it's both and. Um, if you think we should enforce the old laws, sure, let's also add some new ones that work. All right, Connor, go ahead. Maybe muted. Yeah, Connor, you're muted. Yeah, uh, pro streamer hours. How about now? <laughs> yeah, okay, no, you're cool. good. You're good. You're good. All right, excellent. Um, yeah, so this comes down to like an axiomatic uh, proposition. I think SDL and I have gotten into this in the past. Um, basically, the question. So, so I kind of lead with this question, and I'll answer it myself. Um, does a zebra have the right to kick a lion in the face when it's trying to eat it? The answer is obviously yes. There, there's a natural right to self-defense. Uh, basically, if somebody's trying to kill you, you can try to kill them. Oh, okay, hold on. SDL, please explain to me why a zebra <laughs> doesn't have the right to kick a lion in the face if it's about to be eaten. Sure. So the question isn't about individual rights. It's about like society. So the question is, if we as a society make a rule about self-defense, does it lead to more or less death? And so if we make a rule sure. of self-defense and it saves right people, there. sure, all for it. But if we make a rule about okay. self-defense and it kills people, not so good. Okay, so let, let, let's get into that because I'm pretty sure you and I can parse that out, all right? Um, so basically talking about uh, public health harms benefits and, and uh, public be uh, benefit. So more guns leads to more suicide. Okay, so I have heard, and I would be interested in your stats to back this up, um, mm -hmm. I have heard that guns specifically lead to a higher likelihood of suicide being successful. However, um, I basically- yeah, did they don't increase my... the underlying rate of suicide, just the success rate. Right. So that would be my thing is basically if you have a per capita suicide rate that is identical in countries with uh, similar gun control, I don't know how it's so, saying that yeah, there's no, no, more no. suicide. So it's a multiplier. So they have higher attempt rates, but lower success rates. We have lower attempt rates, but higher success rates. It's as simple as that. So if we lowered it, the main reason for that is actually religion. Religion is the best predictor of suicidality. Uh, Catholics mm. and Christians and overall something like three times less likely to do it than atheists. Um, so that's like a whole separate discussion, but America is incredibly religious compared to virtually the rest of the OECD. Um, so like if you were eliminated guns and guns were like down at the rest of the other countries, we would be like a third of the other countries in suicidality. Something along those lines. For logic, why wouldn't I just say, hey, every atheist needs to become Christian because, uh, you know, there's a three times less likelihood that you're going to fucking kill yourself. Uh, sure, because I don't think that <laughs> I think that that one relates to like truth and epistemology, whereas this one just relates to the public health issue. All right. It's like 70 percent of meme anyways. Um, so <laughs> so anyways, um, so more guns lead to more homicide. I just want to concede that. OK, off the bat. Sure. All right. Like we uh, don't you mean suicide. We, but yes, uh, no. Uh, no, I don't want to concede that unless I see evidence of it. So, no, so for instance, I, I believe you're saying that guns lead to suicide. That's the one you're conceding. You don't want to concede nope. homicide yet, right? No, I do want to concede homicide. Oh, I don't okay. want to. Con I don't want to concede suicide. And the reason why is so. For instance, like if you show if you show me year over year that basically like with an attempt, it's more likely to be fatal with a gun. Okay, fine. But if you took a per capita, like European Western developed analysis of like multivariant countries in order to take into account all the cultural differences that are inside the United States, soon, and Mr. we can Canada. like Thanks loosely replicate them within a Western European model, and then they had an identical per capita suicide rate, I wouldn't say that guns are the factor in the suicide rate. 
Okay, so, so we... Uh, so, sure, to interject a bit, I think this is basically just uh, not a misunderstanding per se, but like a mm. failure to apply the standards of research. We can't do that. We can't just be like, hey, I'm going to take a state in the United States, convert two thirds of the population to atheism and see how their suicide rates change. We can't do that as a research project. I would love Impossible. to. Okay, you want to give me the funding? I'll do it. Sign off on the IRB, right? Um, I, props. Um, but we well, can't. So what but, we have to do is we look wait, at but, the United States and we, do, we look at some data on, that. People on an individual level. Well, if, if I well, can real quick, do you mind? Yeah, Isn't that right, kind of exactly what you're doing with these gun control studies? For example, the Brady laws that are touted as a success by you, I believe, uh, in our previous conversation that we had. Uh, yep. The University of Virginia had Philip J. Cook in 2003, who was at I the time considered the work, most uh, aforementioned gun control expert in the country. He was someone who was advocating for gun control. It meant that the decline in homicides we saw over the course of the Brady Bill being enacted were commiserate with the decline we saw previous to the Brady Bill. And in other words, it looks like it was correlation, not causation. Uh, the same is true of homos or suicide rates, except of people over the age of 55. And he said maybe the law saved a handful of lives, perhaps a couple hundred a year. So even he is telling that this gun control, it didn't do exactly what it was said it was going to be doing. So when you say we can't just look at the suicide rates of countries that have less guns because we're not sure if it's correlation or causation, can't we say the same thing about the studies that you're citing that say that gun control saved lives? Uh, no. So the basic argument is that the studies that I try and cite to you are not just correlation. They aren't just saying, hey, we look at a state, we figure out what its guns are. Usually the way they do that is by looking at, ironically enough, the percent of suicides that are committed with guns, because that's a very good proxy for how many guns there are in a state. Uh, and they correlate that with other factors. That's like the, the sort of classic, very common style. It's not a very good research design. The studies that I'm citing, and this is technical, and I can't fully explain it within the scope of this conversation, but they use methods like differences in differences estimation and other more causal estimates. Um, so they do make an attempt to try and find a causal impact rather than just a correlative impact. Um, and I, I'm just going to try and appeal to you that this is a causal method um, that I'm not going to okay. fully. So, there is so I think I think well, sorry, I, okay. I was just going to say, I think what SDL is saying is that uh, we need to get rid of all guns and everybody needs to convert to Christianity. That's what I heard. <laughs> Well, there are actually religions with lower suicide rates. So if we really want to follow down this logic, we need to create like a cult of personality, perhaps around like an anti-suicidality figure. I think we could really push this. <laughs> Welcome to Demon Knight. Just sort of like reverse heaven's gate. <laughs> this is the best. Why haven't reverse I heaven's reverse heaven's gate. gate. Uh, Demon Mama, did you have a did you yeah, want to Yeah, I had a couple things I wanted to touch on here. So there's a couple of other things that uh. would support the data that um that uh <laughs> that SDL is talking about, which is um we have uh we have data that points to the fact that um that most people who attempt suicide once and survive don't attempt suicide again um most of the time um and that seems to be because the experience of attempting suicide is very traumatic and people realize they don't actually want to die but that it was something else in their lives this is well well documented among the research of both depression and suicidality Secondly, um, there is, uh, I, and I don't, I don't have the study on hand, but I assure you we could find it if necessary, um, that points to the main difference in uh, the success rate of suicidality as, as far as method um, and success rate between men and women. I think that you referenced this at the beginning. I don't know how far you went into depth on it, um, but is that most men, their first option that they choose is a gun, whereas most women will choose a it will choose pills or jumping and both of those are very low success rate because as it turns out a lot of times you take a lot of pills you throw up you don't actually die but you do get the fear of potentially dying once you realize that you're going to die and then you might throw up now um there is a problem with uh with the idea of like oh well you know um maybe we should just uh you know have just gun slightly you know stored better and i acknowledge this because my position of course is that i do support gun ownership but the proliferation of guns clearly influences the amount of suicides and the accessibility of that a lot of times if people can't get access to a gun but there's a gun in their house that is maybe not theirs but might be available they might get that they might also get it from a friend in fact i know somebody who killed themselves with a gun that they got from a family member and of course often again the problem with this is that people will think twice when they go to commit suicide, but a gun doesn't really let you think twice. It's a very quick method that that is almost designed, it seems, to be able to give you maximum lethality in the shortest time possible. And that is a huge problem. Veterans are also a, a group that is particularly um, heavily struck by firearm suicides because a lot of veterans have access to 
firearms. So there are problems with this, and I I don't know I don't know how to address that outside of like reducing pro prol proliferation, which I think I don't know that we can do that easily in the United States. I think that voluntary gu gun buyback programs and an approach and and serious changes um, to gun culture would be really 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 valuable towards that. But yeah, it's hard. Okay. I, I actually, yeah, I have direct responses. Um, so just to, just to focus on prescriptive stuff. So, so for instance, like I am not in the political space to dunk on the left. I'm not here to fucking, you know, Oh, the left bad, right. Good. Okay. Um, what I do like to focus on is prescriptions. Um, so for instance, like, um, waiting periods, I, I know that I mentioned earlier that the state of Florida has a three day waiting period for, uh, pistols. My thing is, um, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. Um, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. If there's a three day waiting period or even a 10 day waiting period, but you can still get access to your firearms. And that is basically in order to, uh, you know, ensure that you're not going to kill yourself, kill other people or whatever. I don't give a fuck. That's fine. Number two. Um, I talked about how I don't give a fuck about, uh, you know, market failures. I think that the government has a role to step in for market failures. The reason why I'm for public health care is because we spend 24 percent of GDP on uh, health care. Any developed nation that has public. Yes, we do. In America. It's like 18. Um, but yeah. No, no. This was going to be my next point. My next point is that any developed nation with a public health care platform on average, spend 17% for GDP. We're effectively paying like 8% higher for less healthcare. So basically, we could still have a public healthcare option that is probably relatively robust compared to other Western nations, and we could uh, save some money for R&D. Finally, um, and, and as a part of healthcare, you could have public mental healthcare, uh, basically access to mental health services. This is the material conditions that I wish lefties would concern themselves with. They Two do. more points, and then I'll I'll yield SDL. Well, okay. I wish I wish Democrats concerned themselves with it. I agree with you um, on that. There we go. All right. Finally, safe storage. Uh, we talked about safe storage. Um, stop. Like, uh, there's a product called Stop Box. Um, S T O P B O X. Um, they have rifle. Uh, they have rifle accessories. They have pistol accessories that basically give you a mechanical lock. That way, you can pop it open at a moment's notice if you need uh, immediate access to your firearm. But it basically prevents people from getting access to your firearm. And in your case, this is a part, sub point B. Um, basically, I'm okay with liability laws. Let's say that you knew your friend was homicide, or you knew your friend was homicidal or suicidal. You hand them your gun. They go kill themselves, or they go kill other people that their family or the families of the people that you enable to go kill people they can fucking sue you for basically negligence because you caused a wrongful death by giving away a firearm to a person that you knew was homicidal or suicidal um yield uh, sure so i guess just to briefly respond um i'm totally fine with the gun safe storage things i think that so rand the r-a-n-d corporation uh did a, a, a big like meta study on gun laws one of the big four or five uh, anyways um this gun laws that they thought had reasonably good evidence for saving lives um was safe storage laws like what you're talking about where they punished people um for failing to store guns and it seemed to therefore provide some deterrence for people who didn't store guns safely um so that seems to be a good idea. And then uh, you mentioned waiting periods. I just want bigger ones. Like I think California is a ten-day one. Just make it longer. That's fine. I don't. I don't think your gun right is meaningfully just like diminished if it's like ten days versus three. Um, and then what was it? You mentioned mental health. That's the one I was going to disagree on actually. So I don't think that there is that strong evidence that there's a link between poor mental health and guns um, or homicide in general. Um, I know one of the interesting stats is that. Um, I was I can go find the article um, that like uh, some estimate of like people with serious mental health issues is like 5% in the United States. And it's like roughly the same portion of criminals who have seriously mental health issues, like four to 5%. If anything, people with serious mental health issues are more often the victims of crime than the perpetrators of it. So there's this actually really big problem. And I'm kind of trying to point a little bit to what Demon Mama said way back early in the conversation that laws focus specifically about uh, psychological estimates of mental health don't seem to do very well. So conversely, then improving mental health probably, unfortunately, won't stop much crime. Um, what it, about what about suicide? Uh, oh, yeah, maybe that one, but not the crime part. Yeah, Rob, I, I do. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Rob and then Demon Mama. Okay, so I think that fundamentally there was a misunderstanding or at least a misapplication what I think when uh, SDL said earlier that we could basically permute, we could do both and pass new gun laws and enforce current laws on the book. But the problem is we don't live in a utopia where by fiat we could demand that the government do these sorts of things. So the reality is the way gun laws have currently been applied now, they're only affecting law-abiding citizens and they're not affecting people that choose not to enforce the law. So for example, according to well, that's true uh, about any law. this USA Today article, which I'll link, uh, 
let's see. Uh, he has three. I Trump's know. Justice Department. Uh, uh, the FBI, in reviewing instant background checks for firearm purchases, detected 112,000 line that dry crimes. Yeah. Uh, you want to end the whereby? Uh, yep. All right. One second. I'm slow. Sorry, Boomer here. Yeah, and I, I'm going to share the uh, screen. So if anybody wants to talk about, you know, certain stats or anything and then talk about them, I'll, I'll share them. Yeah. Just to, okay. Yeah. Uh, the FBI in reviewing instant background checks for firearm purchases detected 112,000 line try crimes for fiscal 2017 alone. Federal investigators had names and addresses on the filled out forms. How many were prosecuted? 12, according to a GAO report. So the problem is this, like it's all high minded for SDL to say, oh, we should pass this law. We should pass this law. We should pass this law. But it is clear that our federal government, whether it's through through incompetence, whether it be through lack of resources or whether it be because they don't actually care about keeping guns out of the most violent criminals, people that have lost their right under current laws to have these guns, yeah, I'm actually they're impressed. not After enforcing Shots the really laws good. that are already in the books. And it is, regardless of if you think it's a good idea or not, there is a constitutional right to keep and bear arms. It's a, your second amendment. It's second because it was that important only behind your right to free speech. Uh, by the way, your right to free speech is contingent on your right to defend yourself. If you lose your right to defend yourself, you'll quickly lose your right to free speech, as we're seeing occur. Um, so what happens is if we're talking about restricting or slowing those rights, we should do so with as slight a hand as possible. So if you say, but wait a minute, there are times like, so for example, counterpoints is saying there are times when uh, the private market or individual liberty can't solve a problem. So therefore the government should come in. I would assume Connor would agree with me. They should do so in the most limited, but effective way possible. You don't want overkill. You don't want them doing things that are over taking people's rights that weren't necessary. So the problem I have is this, if we've agreed as a society, okay, Okay, there's certain gun restriction that we accept. For example, certain types of felons aren't allowed to have these guns, and we're refusing to enforce those laws on the book. Why would we then have more laws to have the government come in and do more things if we haven't proven that the laws they've already enforced are successful and they're choosing not to enforce them? Okay. I mean, I think. Demon so oh, good. Demon, uh, demon did you want to respond to that specific point? It looked like you had a study or something. I can go after. Uh, you. No, no, no. I was I was responding just to counter with the study. Oh, um, oh, the, okay. the point I would just raise, uh, I I think the, the the point that I raised at the beginning is very similar to the point I would raise again, Rob. It's just like uh, we do enforce the additional laws that we pass, and so. Um, it seems like, and particularly a lot of these laws are passed at the state level. So to me, then I, I guess maybe I would just have to agree with you. Maybe the federal government is totally sleeping on the job and maybe they should totally be enforcing these laws. Maybe well, this then, would just, obviate just, a lot of the gun then, problems. Just real quick. Let me ask you then. Yes. So then why would, if, so if you're saying I see a problem, right. And the problem is suicides and homicides that are occurring because of firearms. And you understand that the federal government's not enforcing, keeping those out of the hand of the most uh, violent people, or at least the people that have been convicted of those sorts of crimes. Then how do you know the problem wouldn't be solved in the too. status quo by enforcing the laws already on the books? Why wouldn't you demand to see that first before you require additional laws? For all sure, you know, so every problem you're illustrating would be solved if we merely enforce the laws on the book. I think I sure, can touch so on that a little bit too as well. Go ahead, yeah. So um, there's there's a problem, which uh, and I, I brought this up uh earlier which is a problem of proliferation right like certain laws are only going to prevent certain like a further proliferation of arms in america we have a an absolutely unbelievable amount of guns around like people like it's actually ridiculous how many guns we have in america um even for somebody who supports gun ownership um but it, much like uh i, I kind of hate the like this like sort of like truism thing that's said that's like oh well if you make gun laws happen then only illegal people will have guns well i mean you could say that about anything the only people who have nukes are illegal nukes right like i mean the, the problem is is that it becomes increasingly hard you mean criminals right yeah yeah what did you I said say? illegal people i was like oh did you oh, mean like oh, illegal sorry, I, no i meant criminals, <laughs> criminals. You, you know what i mean okay. like uh, just, just make it just... i i was botch botching what, what was said um but the um yeah, like only criminals will have guns or whatever because the guns will be illegal. Well, the same thing goes for, for nukes. Well, citizens can't have nukes, but uh, I mean, you know, it's also really, really hard to get your hands on a nuke because they have only been prolifer proliferated to an incredibly restricted degree. And likewise, I think that applies to guns as well. The less guns that we have kicking around, the less guns that we have legal or illegal is going to ultimately have a dampening effect on a lot of these, um, a lot of the things that we're talking about having huge problems. Now, that doesn't mean, again, that doesn't, I don't advocate for like a mandatory buyback or, or a mass seizure of weaponry or anything like that. But I think we can acknowledge that the amount of guns that we have out here right now is a huge problem and a couple of small reforms that don't have immediate returns doesn't necessarily mean that those won't have long-term returns because at the end of the day the goal is to make it a little bit harder for people to get guns right off the bat 
I mean, there was a point in time where it was a lot easier to get guns. I know. Like, it was even when I was a kid. Like, it was going to a gun show and getting a gun is not a hard thing. So, yeah. Connor? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so, I'm not going to address any of that uh, specifically because I want to address SDL, SDL's uh -huh. point piecemeal. Um, so, <clears throat> so basically, uh, the point that I wanted to concede was not necessarily suicide. We can, we can have a longer chat about that, about how everybody should be Christian. I'm happy you think that every, uh, we need to return to religion. Thank you for mm -hmm. that. Um, but basically, uh, should be basically <laughs> everybody should be a trad cat. Got it. Um, so, all right. So more guns lead to uh, more homicide. This is one of the things that I think the right wing gets tripped up a lot is they just try to fight things that aren't factually true. Uh, mm -hmm. We basically have double the homicides of Western Europe. We're developed countries. We have comparable economies. We have comparable cultures. We have double the homicides. Um, I think 80% of our homicides are by firearms. Hold on, Rob. Uh, I promise I'll get to a point. Um, but that there, there's a question of uh, measurability like, 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 uh, or, or utilitarian calculus that I make. So I kind of preface this entire argument based off of the fact that I think that uh, human beings and living beings in general have an axiomatic right to natural self-defense, which includes the right to destroy their own government. I actually, like, I, I believe that. That's almost like a religious concept. Mm -hmm. So for instance, I think China and Iran, uh, maybe Iran because they're hyper-religious, they might have lower rates of homicide. They might even have lower rates of petty crime. They might have lower rates of suicide. But you could not pay me enough fucking money to live in either one of those societies because I value freedom as a different metric of human success. And then final point before I yield, mm -hmm. you brought up self-defense as the, um, the, the motivating factor for um, you know, the possession of firearms. Um, I think that's one of them. But another one of them is basically the maintenance of the balance of power between civilians and the government. So um, oftentimes when I talk about uh, firearms, it's within the context of the Boogaloo, the libertarian mm -hmm. revolution against the government in order to restore our freedoms back to the, the days of the founding fathers. I don't want a fucking Boogaloo. I don't want an American civil war. But I think by Americans maintaining 350 million plus private firearms, the chances of a civil war between the federal government and the civilian populace or the chances of an ethnic or religious genocide inside the United States is slim to none. And that is a good thing. Yield. Sure. So um, the basic response here is self-defense kind of has two two uh, aspects. One is the axiomatic, like personal self-defense, kind of the gazelle, giraffe example that you're pointing to, zebra. The zebra. I want yeah, zebra. The zebra. Yeah. Something on the plains of Africa was defending itself from a lion or something. Anyway, that's like the personal self-defense. And I think that one's much weaker and much easier to attack. The political one, I think, is much is much more interesting, harder to attack. Um, so the this is something that's interesting that I often argue with socialists as well, because I take a very reformist position here. I don't think that violent revolution is very effective at pursuing these ends. If the government is tyrannical, it will crush you. Um, one of the biggest findings of Chenoweth and Stefan 2011 is that when the state violently represses people, it like reduces the chance of the, pe the people on the other side winning by something like 90%. It's like an ungodly decrease of success. Um, and so within that, even accounting for that, violent revolutions were less successful than less violent revolutions. Um, and that's the basic thesis that I would make. So it's not clear to me that guns good because guns might only be useful for the violent aspect. And if the violent aspect is less useful, it's not actually benefiting people overall. That's the basic yeah. And, and, and Rob, I'm sorry for jumping in, but this is like a really important point. Um, I just wanted to make the point that 79 million Americans owning 350 million private arms makes the likelihood of a, a tyrannical government oppressing their people by force extremely low. And that, that was the only point that I wanted to make. Yeah. I, okay. That's yeah. what I really wanted to say. Can I have a brief response? response? <laughs> because America has 25% of the prisoners and like 5% of the world population. We already live in the state with like incredible amounts of like surveillance and like control. True, over true though. Do you, do you want me to parse that apart? Right, compared real, to real, Europe, we're much worse in that respect. Real quick, uh, we'll, we'll go to Rob and then we'll go to Connor. Okay. Do do you think oh, that those okay. rates of tyranny would be worse if people didn't have these firearms? I do. Like, I think, for example, it, let's say you theoretically argue that the war on drugs, I'm against the war on drugs, but let's say you argue it's mm -hmm. racist and it's designed to go after uh, people based on their skin color. Do you think if those people had, were completely disarmed that the police would have an easier time of taking people that they want to go into these communities and do whatever they want with them? I do. 
I absolutely think that. Uh, and so that, so maybe there's a fundamental difference in what we see with incarceration rates and things like that in this country. Uh, real quick, I wanted to just, it's mm-hmm. an aside, it's not a big point, but to Connor points about more guns equal more homicides. I don't, it's not a direct proportional thing though. So for example, we have 400 million guns. If we had 800 million guns, I don't think you're arguing that would double the amounts of homicide or violence. Like basically everyone has access to a gun that wants one in this country. If we doubled the amount of guns, everyone would basically still have access to a gun, right? Like, you know, that's, that's basically true. Wrong, um, and wrong. so I don't, there's, it's very rare that we would see a situation. And I think that what we see is a lot of these attempts, especially when you have demon moments saying, well, we have too many guns, but I'm not for things like gun buybacks and things like that. Okay. Well then any, if your problem is there are too many guns, nothing you could do without forcing the government to take those guns away is going to decrease the amount of guns. It's wrong. not going to happen. No, People aren't no. going to voluntarily give them yes, up. They will. So the best thing we could do is enforce laws that we already have on the books to stop the most violent people from getting those guns, which our government's chosen not to, which again, I don't think anyone's answered. Uh, I just want to take this in a slightly different direction. Uh, maybe get a little like, well, I did have a couple do, of our, we, we live in a society. I'll just be real quick. We live in a society right now that's saying True. providing identification is racist when it comes to voting. Isn't it true that almost every gun restriction, whether it be uh, taxing or having to have permits for guns or having to have specific things like concealed carry permits or having waiting periods, wouldn't the same people that say providing an ID to vote is racist also say that all of those would be impediments to African-American communities from receiving firearms as well? And, and, and are and you okay with do. that? Okay. And so, they do. So real Whenever- quick. Yeah. Again, let's be careful with the whole voter ID thing. Uh, also, let's go to Demon Mom because she, she, she's been waiting for a while and then I'll go to you, Sockton. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So there's been a couple of, of things going on here. First of all, with regard to the uh, to what Rob was saying, uh, I first of all, I don't believe that anybody who wants to have access to a, a gun does have access right now. In fact, uh, the poorest people in America, arguably the people who are most likely to be the victims of crimes, usually can't afford a gun or have access to a gun at all. And I actually think that uh, what Sock Dunn left brought up earlier about sort of uh, communal armories or something like that could actually change that in a meaningful way. These people, and in fact, would probably achieve your your, your stated goal of having a, a check and balance to the local government, at least, to a much better degree, right? If you have a poor community that has a community-run and community-funded armory, those people will be able to be trained and know how to use guns safely. They will be more informed and stronger. Now, I think that Sockton Left is 100% correct about the idea of... Um, of the uh, the government, like, if the federal government decided to go to war against its own citizens we're fucked we rely purely on on at this point democratic processes and other um other like uh, pseudo democratic processes to prevent the government from ever getting to that point um and that's a good thing because as it turns out in in countries that don't have democratic checks and balances and governments that just allow power to flow autocratically they're able to crush those things out increasingly so we need more democratic processes that limit the power of government so that the, the government will never be in a position to, to do that now i do the one area where i think that is is necessary to discern a considerable difference is that i don't believe much like uh much like we've talked about a couple times i don't think that i think that people who think that like gun ownership is going to lead to a revolution or whatever is, is that's a very silly perspective in my opinion um however i do think that there is some reason to believe um and in fact we have some evidence of this that rob brought up so i'll, I'll borrow from that um which is that uh a lot of local police departments and and things like that specifically ones that have very deep racist roots have a have a very vested interest historically in uh removing the arms of uh marginalized communities i think it makes it easier to marginalize those communities if those communities are not known to be armed and i think that arming them will reduce that however it won't save us from some sort of tyrannical government it might provide a check and balance to local police or state or county power but it's not going to stop the the federal government has drones and lasers and and radioactivity bombs it's fucking not gonna happen so I've done left and then we'll go to connor points sure so i guess waiting. rob the basic thing that i would note this is pure correlation we don't have causal evidence on this because it's so hard to measure both of these things um, places with higher gun ownership actually have higher rates of police violence places with more strict gun laws have lower mm-hmm. rates of police violence the the argument that like police are less willing to victimize people who are armed seems, if anything, to be the opposite of true. When people are armed, police are more willing to use 
extensive force against people because they see themselves at risk and it's part of the culture that that police builds. The more general argument that I would raise, it comes from um, an article by Omar Wasau, I believe 2018, um, called Agenda Seating. It's basically the idea that when protesters use violence, it's so, so much easier to paint them as like radical terrorists trying to destroy America. It's why the BLM riots were painted as such in the right-wing media, even though the vast majority of it was peaceful. Um, it's easy to paint people as violent when you have examples of violence. Um, and so this is the concern that when minorities fight back with guns, you can paint them as terrorists. You can paint them as worthy of suppression. So then that enables the police to use even more force. Right. But uh, just to address uh, this, because I know this is a point that we disagree on a little bit, Socked on Left, but I want to I want to bring this up. So a as far as I know, and I have not been able to find this, maybe there exists one. I don't know that there's any uh, or ever will be studies about how much uh, personal gun ownership can suppress like police wrongful activity. Um, I would love to see some of that data because I, I don't know. I, I think there's probably mm -hmm. a lot more going on there than just gun ownership with regard to over policing. For example, gun ownership is not particularly high in New York City, but over policing is really high in certain neighborhoods, mostly that correlate with minority uh, minority population. Um, and I would argue that there is room for pointing out a history historical precedent here, which is that when you have um, authoritarian, racist, often movements in America, one of their first actions is to to try and disarm m minority communities. We see, we've seen this with the Black Panthers in the past. We've seen there's numerous other organizations that have done this. Now, uh, you bring up that like, oh, protesters fighting back with weapons. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about preventing the circumstances from ever happening in the first place. And I believe that we have historical evidence to show that police departments are much less likely to run completely unchecked um, into racism, into persecuting um, neighborhoods if those neighborhoods are known to have a high percentage of communally organized gun ownership. Okay, so let's go to Connor and then we'll go to Rob and then uh, anybody else who wants to go. Yeah, so um, just to just to address that very specifically, so uh, for those of you who don't know, I was a local police officer for four years. I was actually in um, my community, my former community uh, today. Um, so basically what, what I would say is that um, guns don't really stop cops from what they are going to do. Like, they're still going to do their job. They're still going to get arrested. Uh, but what it does do is it slows cops down to not being complete. I, I know everybody thinks that cops are dickholes all the time to everybody, um, but it does slow cops down to not being dickholes to everybody all the fucking time because you should always lead with tact. You should always lead with diplomacy. You should always lead with basically negotiating people into handcuffs because you don't want to start a fucking gunfight because you were talking too much shit to the citizenry. Um, so that that's one of the things that I would point out. The other thing that I would point out is that I understand that the United States has 25% of the incarcerated population of the world, despite only being 320 million people of the United States. But I almost guarantee you, you would rather be incarcerated here than anywhere else on the fucking planet. Allow Not me Europe. to explain. No. Hold on. Almost done. So I almost guarantee you, as a part of that incarcerated statistic, you're talking about people who got DUIs, bonded out same day, and fucking left. Oh, I almost fucking guarantee you are. Hold on. We'll, we'll get to it in a second. So so basically, do you want to be breaking rocks in fucking Siberia or do you want to get a fucking do you want to bond out of a fucking jail almost same day? As a matter of fact, OK, Demon Rama, I see your face. I'll explain it. Fucking burglars, thieves, shoplifters, simple battery. Almost every single fucking person who committed a crime that wasn't a felony was out within 24 to 48 hours. As a matter of fact, it's one of the most frustrating things about being a fucking cop is the fact that you arrest somebody for doing some serious shit and they're out the fucking next day. Now, I'm not saying that you should revoke these people's bond. I'm just saying it's a little bit different than breaking rocks in fucking Siberia. If you can't give me that, we're probably not on the same planet. Second point, minor yeah, that point. That feels like a false equivalency, though. Well, let him finish. I felt like you, I felt like your point, or not your point. I felt like SDL's point was a false equivalency. All right, um, uh, two two minor points again. Critiques um, can't afford a gun. Um, high points are one hundred and twenty five dollars. They're pieces of shit. They might explode in right. your hand, uh, but they're very inexpensive. And also, uh, I'm not encouraging this, um, but stolen guns are free. Um, then one more <laughs> one more point. Um, because of the power of the federal government. We are we have to purely rely on our democratic processes in order to uh, check the power of the federal government. We can't go to war with the feds because of drones, intelligence services, nukes, aircraft carriers, all that kind of shit. 
Um, I reject this. I reject this fundamentally. Uh, we've been in the global war on terror for 20 years. We've been fighting dudes in flip-flops with like an AK-47 and roadside bombs for 20 years. We haven't conquered these people. Not only that, this goes against the entire nature of asymmetric warfare. I've already done a 20 minute video on it. If you don't like what I'm saying right now, you can go watch my video and then bring your objections to my video to the next. Article. I mean, I'll bring my objections up when it's my so, turn because I do have well, some. So uh, real quick, can, 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 Rob's one waiting for a while and then and then you're next, Stockton left. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. So, uh, just real quick to say to that, yeah, uh, in reality, the price of guns aren't, if you really wanted a gun and if you're poor, there's ways to get a gun. Uh, they're cheap and readily available, and you could have them borrowed by friends. I mean, we're talking about there are more guns than people in this country. So if you really, really want a gun, you're able to get one. That's true where I live in rural America. That's true if you live in the inner city. The only thing that is an impediment to people getting guns, it is cost prohibitive, is some of these laws that we're talking about to have gun control that's the things that could actually be cost impediment wise to keeping people from getting these guns at least legally so if you're really concerned about poor people having access to firearms then you should be against gun control efforts because every one of the efforts that we've talked about would either be cost prohibitory or would be prohibitory in some other sense uh for people that are poor to get these guns secondly we're conflating the idea of the police necessarily coming into your community and doing something most of the police which are fine people and doing fine with a tyrannical government that's ordering the police to do things right and the truth is demon mama you're just wrong when you say well they have nukes and they have apaches and they have you know lasers and things like that and so they would be able to be the problem is the military is made up of people and these people are citizens and we're not just going to have the military nuke large parts of the united states or use apache helicopters if you need to see how well less armed insurgents can be a massively overpowered military you need only look to places like vietnam Vietnam was far outgunned, and there are all sorts of insurrectionists all over the country. It's not as if the citizens of the United States would be fighting a war that would be like a scorched earth policy against the U.S. military. It is that the right to defend yourself is a check on tyranny because they know the people that would be tyrannical know they can't use the full might of the military against U.S. citizens. However, if the U.S. citizens are completely unarmed, then it is easier to be able to infringe on those rights because there's no need or there's no capability to defend yourself with whatsoever. Uh, a couple other things. Uh, the idea of more violence from police occurring to areas that have more guns. Well, the problem isn't that these people, it's because there's more violence occurring in this area. So for example, if you live in inner city Chicago, where there's a lot of shootings, that is the exact place that you would want the right to self-defense and to own a firearm, because it's difficult for police to protect you all the time. In some areas of Detroit, the police call times are 20 minutes before they could come. So that's the very area where you would want to be able to defend yourself. The, the fact that people misuse those firearms and commit gang violence or other sorts of violence that's irrelevant. And lastly, I'll say that what we're ignoring here is it's not just government tyranny. It's also government ineptitude or government corruption. For example, we could see in St. Louis, the cops were unwilling to defend a family named the McClowskis as a violent group broke into their property. And they then charged the McClowskis for exercising their Second Amendment rights. Uh, that's the kind of tyranny that we're talking about. The fact that the that government won't protect I, you is I every reason. I gotta stop you here. Come on, that's uh, ridiculous yeah, And real quick, and I'll give you something else to get upset about here in a second, too. Oh, boy, uh, The Rob idea that SDL... No, I'm not getting mad. I, I said I'll give you something to get upset. Uh, the fact that SDL said that the majority of Black Lives Matter protests were peaceful is one of the dumbest comments that you could ever make because there You're were over 223 locations. Uh, there were over 223 locations of violence that came from BLM just because there were, that was only 6%. If there was 6% of violence in Tea Party movements, we would have said that was a violent movement. In fact, let me ask you this. Did you all have a problem with January 6th? Well, that was a Trump rally. How many Trump rallies resulted in riots? Therefore, would it make sense for me to say the majority of Trump rallies are peaceful? So what are we talking about January 6th? The truth is there were violent riots. And the last thing I'll say about this is, this is... that that violence was respected by our government and institutions, which proves that the ability to defend yourself is something that's important. That's why they'll come after Trump people. That's why they'll come after people that want to violate lockdown orders that are conservatives because they paranoia. don't use that violence traditionally, which means that the government's able to do that. Uh, thank you for interjecting. I'll give you the same courtesy when you're up, Demon Mom. Yeah, sure. I'm sure you will. Yeah. Sure. Well, just right. so Stockton left, go ahead. There, well, there's oh, a oh, lot okay. to respond to. Uh, I'll get to you, Demon Mom. And then Stockton left, Connor points, and then we'll go to Demon Mama. There's a lot to respond to. I don't remember all of it, so I'm going to miss some of it. 
Um, the first thing I would just note, I'm sharing a little thing. I think you might be able to see it counterpoints. It's just a graph of the incarceration rate um, since 1880 or so. And you can see that the modern spike began in the 1970s with the war on drugs. It's not just related to like routine criminalization. It's related to the modern war on drugs and the modern carceral state. You see more or less the same pattern in like immigration detention. It, it wasn't there before in the 50s and 60s and 70s. It's a modern creation. What happened between 1960 and 1970, or what happened between 1968 and 1994? 1968, the, the, the crime wave in part. All right. Yeah, but, sure, but the, the crime didn't increase by five want. times. Crime increased by around like 1.5 to two times. Uh, I mean, doubling homicides, rape, socialism, robbery, uh, uh, no, I make sure to stop, uh, stop sharing whenever oh, you want. Sorry. Yeah, just, I, I don't Somebody know if you're going to say anything. It's okay. It, it's, it's a very minor point. I don't want to suck up your time. I know other people are going to do that. More generally, I think the argument that Please. these are just like routine incarcerations really misses That's the one point. Warning. I believe these metrics are usually looking at like people years that are spent in jails fundamentally. See you later, Bricks. I'm sorry um, you're so not So when we're talking it. about more people years in jails, more people years in prisons, regardless of what it is, that means that there's a bigger carceral state. Um, and so I, I, you know, I don't want to quibble about like the quality of prisons in like Europe or Japan versus the United States. That's not too important to me. Um, like I, I would rather not have five times more people spending time in very high quality prisons. Um, <laughs> I would rather have them not be in prison all together so i, if I guess you, the argument, oh, go ahead. if you want if you want to move to the portuguese model of like decrim of like possession uh possession and focusing on violent crime for law enforcement we agree yeah i mean so it like, oregon looks really promising there hopefully i know seattle's seen an uptick of violence but that might be related to other things anyway um hopefully the oregon decriminalization model works very well so far we, decriminalization, okay. we 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 probably agree and i'll yield really quickly um basically the only thing that makes me uncomfortable is like okay so we have 25 percent of the incarcerated uh state i think there's plenty of other places that you wouldn't want to be incarcerated regardless of the per capita incarceration that's my only point i'm well, not saying that was your point so so the, i think the argument is that that is immaterial to the point that there has been this enormous increase of the carceral That's state, going to be fixed and it was the communities. Fashion. Turns out um, it's a bigger fix. Who were like the most able to be targeted, in particular, like black and and um, other non-white groups in the United States. Um, and we were not able to resist. We are the most armed country on the planet, and people weren't able to resist that. Um, and so I think that it really misses that often when there are these like civil wars, it's not government versus people. It's like 45% of the people and the government versus the other 55%. And so I, I guess what I'm trying to get is like the war on drugs was enormously popular about when it was implemented. Um, people didn't resist it in part because they wanted it. Um, you can go back and look at the polls. People loved it. Um, Including so I, in what communities? I, there was majority support even among black communities at the time. So like, I, I guess what I'm trying to get at is like the, 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 the state cracking down on you doesn't work if the people also oppose you. So I'm trying to actually support Dean Obama's point that the key thing that keeps you safe is people wanting to protect your rights and democracy as a whole. If democracy wants you fucked, you're, you're fucked. Sure. Um, th but then this gets down to like a singular moral argument um, that you guys are both uh, free to address, which is basically like the zebra still has a right to kick. Um, so what I mean by that is basically Jews in Germany, there might have been a mass consensus that uh, they needed to be disarmed or that they needed to be purged from Germany. I wouldn't begrudge any Jew in Germany who chose to arm themselves and rebel against that government. And on top of that, even if the government doesn't recognize their right to resist, I believe they have a natural right to resist. Sure. And so this is why I, I try and make the community armory sort of approach. So I am defending, like for the purpose of moving the argument forward, this argument where like it's no guns, guns aren't useful whatsoever. If you think that they are useful, and I'm trying to carve out this exception because so many people do think it's so useful, then that's what the purpose of community armories is. Um, you don't need the gun in your house to resist the tyrannical government. You alone will die. You need your community to support you if you're going to have any effectiveness, right? You were talking about asymmetrical warfare. That's not one dude with a gun. That's hundreds of thousands of people with guns. Yeah, and, and to so so if I can respond now, that that'd be amazing. So the first thing is discussing the war on terror versus you know out uh, out warring one another. Um, this these are not like saying comparing between us and uh, going into Iraq or Vietnam are not good examples. You're you're talking about a um a, a foreign nation where we're able to deploy all the full force with no considerations whatsoever. Um, these aren't like, and, and, and even then because they have a home field advantage because we're fighting across overseas, which is expensive. That's why they're able to hold these things out longer in the United 
United States, the government knows every single crevice and corner of the United States. They, I, I assure you they do. It's not that they're going to nuke their own s communities, although who knows, maybe they'd pick a state to sacrifice, but they would use overwhelming force. And we can see this even present in, in, in current, um, current, uh, uh pr like protests where the feds get involved in portland there was overwhelming uh uh equipment used i mean fucking military quality uh uh tear gas was used that's causing damage to the town it, it's bad we want to avoid getting to that point at all is the is the goal and i agree with you that i would never begrudge um a a jewish person pick, taking up arms against nazis but um I unfortunately hate to say it, but that they don't have a very, they wouldn't have a very high success rate. And in fact, a lot of them were armed and a lot of them did fight back. The point is we need to stop that from ever happening in the first place. And I, I do acknowledge that you may be able to buy yourself some time or escape or fight back a little bit in order to buy your people an escape. Uh, if you're if you have some level of community armament, but I don't think that you can hold out inevitably against a gov your own overwhelming government. I just don't think that's realistic. Um, and so I wanted to address that first of all, and then secondly, I just wanted to point out that in Rob's uh, incredibly long gish galloping screed, he made uh, abject lies about both BLM and a false equivalence between uh, the sixth and the BLM um, uh, protests that that swept the the nation last summer. And I I'm really tired of that, Rob. You lie about BLM all the time. It's really ridiculous. Honestly. Honestly. Uh, let um, me ask you a question, Team yeah, Mahler. Sure. Did you say all Trump supporters are white supremacists? Uh, no. You haven't said that? No, don't believe I ever have, no. Okay, well, I have a video where you did, but that's oh, fine. Okay, yeah, maybe I mean, maybe I said most okay. of them were. If you have a video, maybe sure, you don't Mike, believe that now, though. Yeah. I mean, you, you I don't, don't think all of them. You I don't, just guys, guys, wait, wait, wait. this has nothing yeah, to do with, to with with gun control. If if we want, we could set up something in the future. Right. That, that I would could, be amazing. I could talk about. Uh, it, I could talk about how it has a relation to gun control because oh, there sure. are people in the government that make that argument. So, for example, after January 6th, which was, you know, I condemned it full heartedly. Uh, people that attack the police, I condemn all political violence, unlike Demon Mama and many people on the left that think political right. violence on the left is acceptable um which is exactly what she's doing now we have 223 oh, really? examples of political location yeah so really yeah. Uh, it, it's funny how Can everyone's you... quiet when everyone's talking well, except it's really mom. funny that like i, I made one answer like and you're like flipping out like, and 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 like I, i'm not I, flipping out yeah, you're I'm like not even literally going noise. off I'm on a bunch of things a... about how like blm is, is satan and i all right, all right. Like, okay, so so on that so note, we I mean, are... I wanted to address the specific point, but it's all right. I mean, he right, went he off again. We're almost done. Yeah, yeah, we're 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 getting we're getting in. Yeah, we're we're getting into like a into like a very con you know. Well, anyways, so everyone else got a chance to finish their point real quick, so I'll finish real quick. I did. not so, asked you one you line. Yeah. But, uh, Okay, no okay. one, no, no one, no one gets to finish their point. No, j just to be fair, sure. just to be because you said, and then it, there was a bunch of back. Yeah, so we'll go into closing thoughts. If you want to mention it, you can. That that's perfectly good. Uh, mm. I, I don't mind that. Uh, uh, oh, you know what? No, the lefties got the got the last word last time, right? So uh, only fair to give them. No, the, oh, the right, the righties got the. And I misread. I I don't remember. Don't don't trust the me. The left got the last word last. Time. Okay, okay, yeah, we'll, we'll give the we'll give the righties the the, the last word on the sure. show just to, just to be just yeah. to be fair. So, uh, uh, Demon Mama, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think it's important that we take a nuanced approach towards gun control. I do believe there's a lot of value to be had in community um gun and responsible gun ownership, but there is no doubt that American gun culture has to change. The state, the 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 sort of status quo in America is not working. It is not good. Um, we have a brutal uh, state repression increasing here in America. Uh, hopefully it won't continue under Biden, but let's be real, it probably will. Um, and uh, that is uh, not a not a good thing. And it's happening even though we got a lot of guns here. So I don't think that the guns are, are the thing that's preventing it. I think we need a broadening of, of, of democracy in our country. I think we need uh, more um, robust and functional institutions. Um, and I think that we should uh, aim to uh, allow people to reasonably attain firearms for the purpose of sustenance and self-defense um, without uh, throwing open the gates to, you know, uh, machine guns mounted on the back of your truck, which I think would just be a really horrible outcome. So, you know, I, I tend to believe I have a pretty nuanced take on this, but I recognize there's uh, there's some very complicated stuff. Like, for example, the number of guns in America is quite concerning, and I don't know exactly how you address that um, without uh, recognizing that I mean, I do think voluntary buybacks are a fine are, are a fine purpose. I did bring that up. I, I forgot that was one of the points I wanted to touch on. I think voluntary buybacks can be good, but it's not that simple. So yeah, that's my position. All right, Rob, go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, so there were a lot of things that were conceded. It was conceded, for example, that the most important and the co most agreed upon gun restrictions that we have for those for violent felons and things like that when they attempt to purchase firearms uh their federal government 112,000 times that attempted to happen in 2017 the most recent data that we have the federal government decided to apply charges to four of them not 4,000 not 404 and all of the arguments we're talking about the problems with gun violence and things like that it is a people I'm glad that are nobody can understand what rob is saying crime. so if we can't even enforce the laws that are on the book that see criminal to punish criminals for having guns why would we then affect more law-abiding people by instituting more laws we should approach this nobody with as depth a hand saying. as possible with the federal government instead of having the government overreach right. and just pass more laws without enforcing the priors people say e well we could enforce both but it doesn't make sense why wouldn't you make sure that enforcing the current laws didn't solve the problem why would you just seek to pass more and more laws and the truth is because we all know that the federal government isn't going to change the way that they're enforcing the current laws so the passing of the new laws again will no only have the net effect of decrease, decreasing law-abiding citizens from having guns secondly uh the idea uh like demon mama talks specifically there about tyranny and about how tyrannical the government is this is the exact reason that you should have the right to self-defense to prevent more of this government tyranny from occurring it seems hilarious to me that the no. argument seems to be our government's so super tyrannical they're horrible so we should all disarm ourselves we should have more laws to disarm ourselves we think that'll work out he didn't uh, listen. i don't think that'll work he out the idea listen. that the federal government would somehow be able to beat us in a War means that we shouldn't have guns to protect ourselves. He literally from didn't is listen. Nonsense. It's not going to be a full fledged war. He that is not the type listen. of thing that would occur. They're not going to just use Apache okay. helicopters okay. and tanks. The idea is you they can't. are less willing to inflict, inflict tyrannical laws if you don't have the right to defend yourself. That's what's going on. <laughs> Lastly, on BLM and stuff, I know that you wouldn't want to Fucking talk about that. Why would you? You're defending violent people. So that's all the more reason to defend yourself. We can see I already the did, were bitch. unwilling to defend people. For I already did. Leftist, I already beat you on that. Uh, terrorist attacks that were occurring around the country. So I already the beat him on this topic. To that was you, my first debate. A human right to be able to defend yourself. All right. Nice. Uh, socked and left. Go ahead, sir. Two minutes. Sure. So I guess to summarize my prescriptive statements in this debate, um, in the short term, the things that I'm interested in are universal licensure, extending the background check to be universal, um, requiring, again, long ass name, domestic violence restraining order, um, gun relinquishment <laughs> requirements, um, uh, banning, uh, sorry, uh, what are called extreme risk protection orders. We didn't get into them too much, but they're sort of similar to domestic violence restraining orders, except they're more related to like posting about wanting to like kill people in like government stuff like that. Um, and then like mandatory safe gun storage sort of laws. And all of the stuff that I'm talking about is like very politically feasible, Mom's pulling spaghetti. like the 70 to 80 percent range. Rap gun. Um, Long term, the thing that's definitely not politically feasible right now, my dream would be like a world with like little to no civilian gun ownership in the household. Um, and entirely a shift towards a community ownership model. I'm sure because we're going to get some blood the only after this too, that so actually makes sense for any gun ownership stick around. is be based on this idea this. of political freedom. I don't think, I don't believe it, but it's the only one that could even come close to being true. I think that the arguments about homicide, about suicide, about self-defense, all I'll fall in favor of the having panel. less We're going to do Q&A as guns. always, debates. Um, so all of these arguments, I, I think, fall against I household and individual gun ownership and don't fall in worry. favor of, at best, community ownership of guns. So I very much like to carve out that exception because in the United States, as we've noted repeately throughout this debate, there's a Odd on, million guns. We're not going to so. be able to ban them uh, de facto really ever, I think. Um, so we need to switch to a more responsible ownership model uh, for like short term again, safe storage, and then long term. Yeah, I'll bring the socket left on. I'll be invited. Um, that's the take. All right. Counterpoints, go ahead. Two, two minutes. Yeah. So I like when I get to talk to SDL because I think we fundamentally disagree, but we can do so in a respectful manner. Um, I think there is a utilitarian calculus um, that uh, he's not conceded, but just admitted might exist. Um, that basically we are uh, checking the power of the government. The political argument is the strongest one. Um, here's, here's one for self-defense. It's anecdotal, but I'm still going to go for it. Um, so basically, um, I, I was talking to my friend today, uh, one of my mentors, one of the people that I love most in the world. One of the things that bugged him was that a storekeeper who had broken the food desert in the traditionally black neighborhood in our community, um, him and his wife were murdered while they were closing up their store. Um, the robber didn't really have a motivation to kill them. He already had the money. He was walking out of the store uh, and he just decided to kill them anyways. Um, he did do it with a firearm, but he could have done it just as equally with a knife. Um, there was no real motivation for it. Um, so basically, with my perception of the situation, I think storekeepers um, should have the right to keep and bear arms on their person um, and that they have an incentive to do so, robbery being one of them. If you look at countries in the Commonwealth, um, some countries in the Commonwealth have higher robbery um, higher robbery statistics than we yeah, do. Also, I'll not offer. only that, but I'll you can offer. actually find uh, compilation videos of British and Australian storekeepers running out of their stores because gangs of people with hammers 
hammers and knives are running into their stores. I don't want to live in that society. I would perfectly be fine with uh, basically the robbers getting shot. Um, so uh, with that point being made, um, the war on terror not being equivalent, the government w uh, was able to go full, fo full force with no considerations. Yeah, on the domestic front, they wouldn't be able to go full force with no considerations because every single time they would be on cell phone camera and shared with all of their community. Home field advantage. Insurgents in America would still have the home field advantage. We're here. We know the territory. Erosion of tax bases. You said that, uh, oh, like uh, we eroded the money. Wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to keep the, uh, the financing. How do you keep financing when you burn half of the country? That's an interesting question. Uh, when you, uh, how do you keep financing when you lose popular support and people stop paying their taxes? Um, knows every quarter and crevice You're of the community. Arguing well, the uh, American military government is points. federal, basically meaning that it's drawn from all of the states, meaning that These they're going to regions that they wouldn't necessarily understand. Just because soldiers and troops um, are you know, it's basically okay. a part of the federal government, if they get deployed to Texas, but they're from New York, they're not going to know the quarters. These are my crevices. points, though. Um, and then finally, wouldn't have a high success rate for the people. We agree here. We actually agree here. It sucks. Um, it sucks, but it's true. Uh, that being said, I still think people have a moral right to do it. Um, and also, here's another place where we agree. The whole point is to prevent it from happening in the first place. I know I'm running out of time, but I want to make one more final, very important point for the first conversation. Nixon, a Republican, created the EPA, which means that if you're on the right, doesn't mean you have to hate the environment. True. Secondly, most people on the right wing are Christian. And if you remember what is in the Bible, it says, um, yeah, I want, I want the last t five, 10 seconds. All right. Christianity calls us to be stewards, which means that we maintain the world. Being a steward does not mean that you get to fuck it in the ass and do whatever you want to do with it. It means you maintain it properly. Being right wing should not be anti-environmental. What if Mother Earth yeah. wants to get fucked in the ass? All right, guys. Uh, final stretch. Final stretch. Just a couple questions from the audience, okay? Uh, first question, and no re no rebuttals. Like, whoever it's directed to, whoever wants to answer it can, but no re no rebuttals. Uh, Angie Kyle, 74, says, uh, asks, should the federal government have had standing to impede on the state laws for gun control, and why? Yes, supremacy clause. Yeah, it's the supremacy, like, yeah. <laughs> Well said. But that's right. a reason that state laws shouldn't have the the federal law says that you have the Second Amendment is a federal law. So the states shouldn't be allowed to override that as well. OK, sure. Uh, Key Lime Platypus asks, ask uh, uh, Socialism Done Left, which of his opponents has a better beard? Uh, I think Counterpoints has like more of the multicolored sort of like classic old guy beard. So I kind of like that. OK, <laughs> I'm getting good. there. I got some white in here. Uh, <laughs> All right. Uh, Galil uh, da Dodi um, asked the lefties, with over 20,000 firearm laws between the states and federal government, and they don't even enforce some of them, why the hell would anyone support more? Well, I mean, that's an easy answer. They work. Just, just because, uh, yeah, like the number of laws doesn't necessarily mean anything. Like, I don't know anything. There's no con There's no context for how many of those, like whether those are... I don't know. That just seems like a really silly question to me. It, it, I, I don't care about more. I just care about laws that do a better job. I don't really, the number doesn't matter. I never made an argument that we should increase the number of laws by 10,000 laws. Like, that's stupid. It's possible that some laws right now are stupid, should be removed, maybe. But I don't think that there's like a finite maximum number of laws. We've hit that cap and now we've like got a ration which laws. That's just a silly sort of argument. Okay. Uh, Ripe for Parody asks, if more... Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, if more guns increase safety and decrease crime, how many more guns does America need to become the safest country in the world? <laughs> All right, so that, that's a, hold on. That's a, that's a straw man argument directed towards the right. <laughs> My argument was never that guns make us safer, okay? My argument is that guns make us incrementally less safe, but there's a utilitarian calculus that we're right. making to maintain freedom. So for instance, I will concede homicides. I would be interested in suicides. But at the same time, if you look at uh, per capita homicides on a national by national basis, we're at five per 100,000. I think most developed countries are between two and three per 100,000. But there are countries that are in a state of failed status that are as high as 55 per 100,000. So, so basically, like, scale it within the realm of reality. Yield.
And I'll just say, I'll just add to that real quick. Like you also have to understand that the guns are already here. Right. And the guns were instrumental to the foundation and the expansion of this country to become no, what it is today. No, and so the idea that, that you could true. just say, well, guns are that evil and true. they cause more homicides. The, you know, the canary has been let out of the cage. Like there's nothing that anyone's recommending here that would get guns out of the hand that would remove guns and any attempt to do so would bag. result in Canaries if you try to the force the government to take guns from people in large amounts, it will result in more bloodshed and more homicide and it would be a really terrible thing. Okay. All right. Uh, Galil Dowdy again asks, uh, why doesn't the left propose a reform gutting existing shit that's proven to be ineffective first? then talk about new policy i guess that was kind of just like the the last question that we asked huh you can do both at the it's same uh time. because it's not either or it's both and it's the same sort of argument you can do new laws they work when we study them they work so let's do them if other laws don't work we can get rid of them yeah super easy yep they don't work all right uh so guys i, I just want to say it was a really really good conversation uh, we had agreements across the aisles uh disagreements in their respective sides i, I thought it went really well you know I, it got a little catty at the moment but what debate doesn't yeah you know uh, so crypto. i want to thank we'll you guys for coming to the normal debates uh make sure to sub and follow the channel guys um whichever chat you're in as well um again let me let me uh, congratulate demon mama on uh being the winner of the hippy dippy rumble uh where where vosh the current champion will defend his uh, title this Friday against Demon Mama, Rob Nor, and John Burke in a fatal four-way. Make sure to check it out. You can check it uh, on Demon Mama's channel. I'm sure she's going to be streaming it. Same with Rob uh, and, you know, uh, Dylan as well. Uh, thank you guys for coming. I hope you guys come back in the future. Uh, check out every everybody's channel. Uh, Demon Mama, where can we find you? Uh, you can find me, very, very simple, demonmama.com. All of my links are right there. The Discord is super active. I usually stream on YouTube, but I also have been streaming on Twitch as well lately. But demonmama.com is where you want to go to find all my stuff. It's right here on the screen. Uh, I just wanted to point to it, but I forgot my camera's flipped. Um, yeah, and if you uh, if you didn't like my opinions, if you like my opinions, please come by after every panel. I always leave myself open for some Q&A and some debates. And that, by the way, is extended out to the members of the panel. Uh, Connor points, if you want to challenge me on whether I'm a crypto tanky, hint, I'm not, please do come on. I would love to have that conversation with you. Likewise, Sock Done Left, uh, I extend the uh, the uh, invitation. If you'd like to chat after this, that'd be great. Uh, Rob Nora, I know we're going to be debating on Friday, but likewise, feel free to come by if you have something you want to further argue with me on. Um, and likewise to the audience. Thank you very much for having me here. All right. And uh, I had a question in the audience of the time zone. It's 8 p.m. Eastern Standard, right? That's the time of the hippy dippy? Anybody? Yes, uh, I'm pretty sure. Tomorrow, yeah. Yeah, 8 p.m. Eastern? Yeah. Okay, yeah, 8 p.m. Uh, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time uh, is when is when uh, the Fatal Four will be happening on Friday. Um, we'll talk socialism about that after, done left. Lonnie. Where can we find you? I'll talk about that after. If you Google socialism done left, you will find me. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, count, ca counterpoints. Where can we find you? Relying on a capitalist corporation to get your name <laughs> out there. I see. And yet you live in a society. Um, yeah. So um, yeah. So the my name's Connor. I run a YouTube channel named Counterpoints. You can go onto YouTube, type in Counterpoints. I should be the uh, top one or two channels available. Just broke 5K, pretty excited about that. Um, also, another way to um, follow me is go onto Twitter. Um, I know it's a hell site, but it's very fun. Um, and basically, you can follow me at Counterpoints, C-O-N-O-R-P-O-I-N-T-S, C-O-N-O-R-P-O-I-N-T-S. And then um, Demon Mama, unfortunately, I do have a wife, and I have work tomorrow, and I have a call on the circuit before I go to bed. But if you want to do something um, either more formal or if you just want to do something informal um, in the next week or two, um, I would absolutely be down to just come on and have a chat. So, yeah. Nice. Uh, Rob Knorr, where can we find you? Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm on Normal America with Rob Nor on YouTube. I'm on DLive with Normal America. Um, and on Twitch, where I usually stream most of my stuff, it's just Rob Nor, all one word, lowercase, like you see spelled there. Um, thanks to everyone for coming on the show. I thought this was uh, a really good conversation, even if there were you know disagreements and things like that. I thought it went really well. And really thanks to you, Demon Mama, for stepping in at the end. Uh, that's not something that's easy to do, and I really appreciate it. And I'm sure SDL appreciates it as well, because it probably wouldn't be fun uh, if we just had three people, uh, you know. So, mm -hmm. though I will say that there was more uh, crossing lines. I think it wasn't that anyone was super ideological and uh, not agreeing with anyone's point on the other side. So. But still, thank you. To a certain degree, yeah. All right. Uh, again, good luck to the panelists this Friday. Uh, thank you guys for stopping by. Uh, I'll see you guys later.
All right. Catch up. I guess. Good time. Have lovely Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. So, take it easy, man. Uh, all right, everybody. Damn, that was a good convo. Hold on.